devices so that the case the board can hear cases without any kind of interruption. For these public hearings, the board reviews correspondence submitted in support of and opposition to these cases. The board also reviews correspondence and recommendations from other government agencies in preparation for the hearings. In today's hearing, staff will present the site plans, maps, photographs, and other documents that comprise the uh, case record. At the conclusion of the staff presentation, the appellant will present his or her case to the board. After the appellant's presentation, the board will hear those wishing to speak in, speak in support of the appeal. And if the appeal has opposition, the board will then hear from the opposition. After the opposition presents its testimony, the appellant will have a period for rebuttal. According to the BZA rules, the appellant has five minutes for presentation if no opposition is present. In contested cases, the BZA rules allow 10 minutes for each side to present testimony. Should the appellant wish to provide a rebuttal to any opposition, the appellant should reserve some portion of that time from their originally allotted 10 minutes. At the conclusion of each hearing, the board will deliberate and then vote on the case. The vo board is vested with the power to act on these cases under the provision of the Metro Code, Section 174180. All section numbers that we refer to come from the Metro Zoning Code, which applies to the entire metropolitan jurisdiction. The, the zoning code was adopted by the Metro Council and became effective on January 1st, 1998. I will introduce the entire zoning code and make it a part of today's record. The Metro Code requires a record of these proceedings. Because VZA meetings are recorded for the Metro Nashville network, it is imperative that anyone addressing the board come forward to the front table and speak into the microphone. All speakers should identify themselves by name and address and then make their desired presentation. The Metro Code requires four members of our seven-member board to establish a quorum. The code also requires at least four affirmative votes to grant an appeal. In the event that five or more members are present but the appeal fails to receive four affirmative votes, the case will remain on the board's agenda for the next 30 days. Applications that fail to receive four affirmative votes within 30 days of the public hearing shall be deemed denied by operation of law. Pursuant to board rules, an aggrieved party may appeal board decisions to Chancery or Circuit Court within 60 days of the hearing date. Additionally, as per the BZA rules, an aggrieved party may file a motion for rehearing by the BZA within 60 days of the original hearing date. After that time elapses, the board's decision becomes final and no further action may be taken. If your appeal is granted, you're required to obtain the permit for which you applied. The permit must be obtained within two years for board approval to remain valid. It should also be noted that if false or misleading testimony is presented to the board, any board approval could be revoked at a later date by means of a show cause hearing before the BZA. Mr. Chairman, I submit that all cases have been filed in proper order, all appellants have been notified by certified mail, and all legal notice requirements have been fulfilled. I do have some preliminary announcements regarding deferrals and withdrawals on today's docket. First, case, six, uh, case number 2018-644 has been deferred indefinitely. Additionally, case 2018-677 has been deferred indefinitely. Cases, uh, these are all deferrals to the February 7th, 2019 meeting. That's 2018-514. And these are all short-term rental cases if you're looking for it on your docket. 2018-514, 2018-636, 2018-637, 2019-014, and 2019-015. Again, all four of those cases have been deferred to the February 7th, 2019 meeting. Case number 2019-039 has been deferred to the February 21st meeting. That's also a short terminal case if you're looking for it on the docket. And then cases number uh, 2018-690, 2018-691, 2018-692, 2018-693, and 2018-694 have all been withdrawn. Finally, case number 2018-700 has been withdrawn. 2018-700. And Mr. Chairman, as you know, at this point we would move forward with the consent agenda, however, because we don't have a quorum, we'll need to take a brief pause until we get our well, fourth member okay, to establish well, the quorum. I'd like to say one thing. Oh, we have our quorum right here. Oh, we have our quorum. So there, people Thank always you. wonder how you can, you know, file a complaint or, you know, communicate with the city. There's one great powerful tool that's now available on your smartphone called Hub Nashville. It's a downloadable app. You can report, you know, if there's a pothole or a codes violation, and it goes directly to the codes department. We're using great technology to track that. You can do it with your name. You could do it anonymously, but Hub Nashville, everyone should have that 
on their smartphone because it is a very valuable way to kind of report something very quickly and efficiently and it's more efficient for us to kind of handle those complaints to or concerns. So. Ms. Lamb. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, uh, as we now have a quorum for members of our public, our board utilizes a consent agenda at the beginning of each of its meeting. One board member reviews the record for each case prior to the hearing and identifies those cases which meet the criteria for the requested action. If the reviewing board member determines that the testimony in the case would not alter the material facts in any substantial way, then the case is recommended to the board for approval. We'll enter into the record those cases that have been so recommended, and if anyone is here in opposition to one of these cases, please raise your hand, make sure I see you. We will pull it off the consent agenda and hear it in its regular order. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, these are the cases that have been recommended for the consent agenda. First, case 2018-619, involving the property at 420 Humphrey Street, requesting a sidewalk variance. I would note that the applicant has agreed to the recommendation from the planning department. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 619? Yes, we will pull that one off of the consent agenda and hear that one, Mr. Chairman. And, 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 all right. The, the only thing on these is that is it, 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 where is the, is the planning department recommendation available to the, the public? Because it, you know, it, it, it's, it's rare that we do something different than what the planning department recommends. And if the planning department recommends something that the applicant agrees to, that's why it's on the consent agenda. And I, I don't want the public to not have the opportunity to speak, but I also want to make sure that, that the folks who are here who are opposing a sidewalk variance thinking that someone's getting away with not putting in a sidewalk or paying into the fund, that's extraordinarily rare in the planning department's recommendation. And if they do recommend that, it's such an extraordinary thing that we typically go along with it. So not, not trying to right. know, tell the public yeah. what to do or anything else like that, but just so that, that you all know uh, that, that that when Ms. Lamb says that they have agreed to the planning department recommendation, that's uh, that's usually uh, a very good thing. Mr. Taylor, you might not have seen it because Councilman Sledge is standing by in the post back there, but he was one of the people also in opposition, so okay. you know we'll, we'll but hear. But to answer your other question, the planning recommendations are a part of the board packet, which is public record, so that are available for the okay. public, but we can certainly make those available at and the that, meeting yeah. if there are any questions. And that wasn't like meant to, to be this. critical at all by the folks that raised their hand. It was just sure. that often people don't understand what that means, and is, if you still are in opposition, that's perfectly fine, and, and we're happy to hear it. Right. Thank you. Um, next case for recommended for the consent agenda, Mr. Chairman, is case 2019-018, involving property at 2709 Brightwood Avenue, requesting a rear setback, setback variance to allow a detached garage. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 18? Seeing none, the next case is 2019-022, involving property at 5315 Nolansville Pike, requesting a variance from distance requirements to allow the applicant to repair an existing dilapidated sign. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 22? Yes, we will pull that one from the consent and hear it in its regular order, Mr. Chairman. Uh, next case for recommended for the consent agenda is case 2019-026, involving property at 5711 Granny White Pike, requesting a sidewalk variance with the proposed alternative sidewalk design. Uh, please note, board members, that the planning department has reviewed and agrees with this alternate sidewalk design. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 26? Seeing none, the next case is 2019-029, involving property at 6922 Highway 70 South, requesting a sidewalk variance and continuation of non-conforming use. The applicant has agreed to planning's recommendations with respect to the sidewalk request. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 29? Seeing none, the next case is 2019-030, involving property at 2101 Old Hickory Boulevard, requesting a sidewalk variance. The uh, applicant agrees to the planning recommendations on this case as well. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 30? Seeing none, the next case is 2019-036, involving property at 401 Center Street, requesting a special exception for a church to build single family homes, modular classrooms, and an institute building. Additionally, um, a setback variance and sidewalk variance are requested. The applicant has agreed to planning recommendations on the sidewalk request. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 36? Seeing none, the next case is 2018-038, involving property at 4800 Lebanon Pike, requesting a sidewalk variance. Applicant has the, the applicant has agreed to plan these recommendations. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 38? 
Seeing none, the last case recommended for consent agenda is case 2019-040, involving property at 311 Gallatin Avenue, requesting a sidewalk variance. The applicant has agreed to planning's recommendations. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 40? Seeing none, Mr. Chairman, to review, the cases on the consent agenda are 2018-018, 2019 02 2019-029, 2019-030, 2019-036, 2019-038, and 2019-040. Mr. Chairman, at this point, staff would respectfully solicit a vote from the board. Okay, wonderful. Those cases have been um, properly moved to the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion about the consent agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Ms. Lamb. Uh, members of the public, if your case was just approved on the consent agenda, although you're welcome to stay for the duration of the meeting, you are free to go at this time. Please give our staff until Monday to process all the necessary paperwork and documentation associated with your appeal, um, at which point on Monday you can come in to pursue those permits for which you have applied. Mr. Chairman, before we move on to cases to be heard by the board, we would like to take the opportunity to rec recognize any elected officials who are here. Um, well, I, I want to recognize on her way out, Council Lady Mina Johnson, who's not running again. Come up here one more time and just say hello. You've been here as a council person and here as a representative, a leader in your neighborhood. So we would just want to say, you know, we've really enjoyed your voice and all that you do for your district. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your service. And it is not a hard, you know, easy job. And you have to sacrifice your day and have to give a great consideration. I really appreciate uh, your participation. And I will do my best the uh, rest of my time until mm -hmm. expire. And I may see you time to time. Yes. Thank Th you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady Johnson. Councilman Sledge, I saw you. Would you like to address the board now or when the when the cases come up. All right, Mr. Chairman, then absent any other announcements, we're ready to move forward okay. with the first case. Yes. Mr. Chairman, the first board, uh, case for consideration by the board today is case 2018-619, involving property located at 420 Humphreys Street, requesting a variance from sidewalk requirements to construct two family homes without paying into the sidewalk or building, um, I'm sorry, paying into the sidewalk fund or building sidewalks. Uh, on the zoning map here, you see the zoning of the property is MUL. Here you'll see the aerial photographer, photography giving you a sense of the surrounding area. This is, uh, before you now, you'll see the site plan showing the proposed construction at this location. And then finally, a picture showing you the current, prop, uh, current status of the property as well as across the street and up and down the street. Uh, Keith Dowd is the appellant of, uh, for this particular case. Mr. Dowd, are you in the audience? If you would come forward, you will have five minutes to make your presentation to the board. Um, actually, is anyone here in opposition to this case? Yes, there was. Okay, so you will have, seeing that there's opposition, you'll have 10 minutes to make your presentation. Um, please remember to state your name and address for the board and then a lot any time you want for rebuttal that will come out of your initial 10 minutes. Okay. Oh, please press the button at the bottom and name and address. Pull the microphone. Yep. My name is Keith Dowd, and I live at 1518 Clayton Avenue in Nashville. And I had originally was kind of under the impression uh, that after agreeing to staff uh, approval to pay into the fund, we had originally purchased this property. Um, being the MULA, we needed um, some time to do calculations for stormwater because of the amount of uh, how many units and just kind of figure out what we can do with the property. So the first thing was to figure out what to do with sidewalks. Um, since the sidewalks, building them does affect uh, stormwater, we wanted to um, 
kind of go this avenue first. So we did agree uh, to that. I didn't realize until a couple, uh, a few days ago, I did uh, correspond with uh, Council uh, Member Sledge uh, to uh, told him that we were willing to pay in the fund. He asked what we were going to build. We haven't uh, hired an architect to go um, with anything vertical to figure out what what we can actually do with the property. So I had, we had deferred through uh, the holidays twice. So we were going to defer to to, uh, to be able to talk to him. Um, so how, how does building a sidewalk impact stormwater? We are because we would uh, be dedicating that uh, that amount of uh, pervious surface to for the sidewalks. Oh, in case you in case you dedicated the right of way or whatever. And we will st would still dedicate the right right of way, but that would uh, um, that wouldn't impact the uh, the pervious surface. So you're saying that your property line goes if you, to the street. Your pro the the sidewalk would be on your property. We would be dedicated another foot of. So it impacts the pervious surface by foot. It, I mean, you're only responsible for the pervious surface on your property, right? Correct. And we feel like that we kind of have, have a hardship with it dropping somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 feet from front to back. And those those but calculations, a foot does make a difference in 42 feet of a width of a lot. I want to ask, I think I heard you say that you told Council Member Sledge that you would be willing to pay into the fund, yet yeah. I see your application saying that you do not want to pay. Well, so that, what is it? Are you willing we, to pay? I amended that with, a, uh, with an email to, um, oh, okay. to Planning Commission. Thank you. Ms. Lamb, can we see some of these other pictures? He was talking about a drop-off in this property. And, and what... Now, it, I mean, so the, the real photos. Mr. Chairman, this is the uh, site plan, which will show you some of the topography. Okay. The photos that we have from our site visit are here. Um, and then I don't believe the aerial, this is the aerial photography, if that helps you at all. So let's go back to the real photo. So where's the drop off? Going down that hill. It, the picture doesn't Going show. into your property, not down the street. Is that what you're saying? Yes, so if you were to walk within 10 feet, it would drop dramatically down towards the alley. And can you bring up that other site plan? It looks like you have a, a sidewalk across the street, so how is your, how is Pillow Street different on your side than it is on the side across the street? The other, the other photo, that one. Isn't that with the fence across the street, isn't that Pillow Street? Yes. And that's the sidewalk going down the same side that you'd be on. I'm not I'm not sure if it's if it's the same grade. I know I just know our I haven't really looked at that. I know our topography is over ten feet from from that telephone pole to the alley. And, and do you have an I mean and again the The, the, um, I, I, do you know exactly how much this one foot extra sidewalk will impact your stormwater requirements or issues? No, because that's the first in our feasibility study with a civil engineer that we uh, engaged. That because I mean I'm trying to I'm trying to judge the hardship, and right now it's an undefined hardship, right? I mean, you, sure. the, the only hardship you've stressed or expressed is potential impact on stormwater, um, and and the width of the lot and being on a corner. But the width, of, if you're giving up the right of way for a future sidewalk, that should have no impact because you're going to have, I don't understand how that impacts you because if the city wanted to come in and put their own sidewalk by you giving the right of way, they have a right to do that at their expense and it does, the width of the lot, I'm not sure what that means. Okay. There's, um, well, I mean, it, it help me understand. I'm not trying to be sure. sharp. I just don't know what that means in terms of a hardship. Well, I, I was under the impression that if they come in and build the sidewalk, that they would build the sidewalk and improve the uh, entire block face and would be able to address the stormwater as a whole, opposed to us having to address just one small section, giving up that whole 
you know that whole area on a small on a small lot and right now the sidewalk would go into um, a chain link fence with razor wire and I think it would be more beneficial for stormwater uh, to for us to pay into the fund and fulfill that whole sidewalk from block face full two blocks or one actual so well, I have a question this is a what we call a trending growing whatever neighborhood uh, Nashville we have an email from councilman sledge that he wrote last month that says this street lot leads into a high pedestrian high pedestrian era area of the neighborhood and the sidewalk should be built so address you know we need sidewalks sidewalks are important there's coffee shops and restaurants and furniture stores and Apple music's come into the neighborhood so why not don't you need this to kind of of take care of all the foot traffic that's going to be around? Well, I feel like as of now, it would just go into uh, a chain link fence, like I said, but there is sidewalks on the other side of the street, and I do believe that that neighborhood looks, it definitely needs sidewalks, and I felt like paying the fund was a, I think was a, a, a fair, a fair response on our part. And that way, that whole that whole street would get it at the same time. They're putting okay. sidewalks in our neighborhood now, and they're completing them from block face to block face instead of. Okay. Any more questions for the applicant before we hear from the opposition? Okay. Uh, you'll have some rebuttal time, and let's hear from the opposition. And the council person gets to choose when they want to speak to. You. So, those in opposition, this is your time. Come forward, please. Come forward. State your name, address, and why you're in opposition to this request. Right here, okay? Yes. Okay. okay. Please state your name, address, and why you're here. Uh, my name is Kat Jones. I'm at uh, 1229 Curry Road in Nashville, and I'm the executive director of South Nashville Action People, the neighborhood association. Um, and we, uh, our main opposition is that this is a heavily trafficked area. Um, we have some very popular bars within half a block radius from, from that area, it's some of the most popular bars in the city. And we also have some of the most popular coffee shops in the city. We have three of them in a half a block radius as well. Um, and to justify having that many coffee shops, there's a lot of foot traffic in that area. It's actually pretty intense as well as um, multiple office spaces in that area. Apple Music is coming in. We have the Soho houses coming in. This, is, this area is only gonna become more and more and more trafficked over time. And South Nashville Action People is pro sidewalk. Um, and we want to make sure that our residents are protected from the traffic by the sidewalk and um, that it's accessible for all of our neighbors. Okay. Oh, please press the button at the bottom. Thanks. Hi, my name is Bill Perkins. I live at 416 Humphrey Street, which is the adjacent property, and I also own 414 and 412. So in that block of Humphrey Street, there's four lots. And I own three of them. Um, I've lived in that house for 40 years. I was one of the four co-founders of SNAP 30-some years ago and have worked all the time to build a very nice nice neighborhood. Which so you lived there when it was Trimble Bottom. Yes, and Rat Town, did you know it was called that? Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I have a history there. Um, the neighborhood needs sidewalks, it's always needed sidewalks. And so that's the point I want to make, is okay. that we need the sidewalks down Pillow Street. Um, so to, to address his, you know, he's talked about, well, it just goes into a chain link fence or something like that. Talk about your street. Humphrey Street? Or yeah, or but what he's talking about, this, you know, he just says it goes into it. You've got the one across the... Pillow yeah, it's Pillow Street. The sidewalk is Pillow Street that we're talking about. Right, if you went to a different picture, you could see the, there, the lower right picture, the telephone poles in front of the lot. That's a coffee shop right across the street, the green building with the fence. That's new. There's a church. You can see the red building across the street. Uh, the way Pellow Street was developed was one of the first streets developed in the neighborhood, and there, the lots were bought individually. They were not bought at once. 
So my understanding is that sidewalks weren't put in because it was done so haphazardly. There was no cohesive plan for sidewalks all the way down. So I don't know if sidewalks can ever be put back on Pillow Street. Everybody's driveway ends at a different spot on Pillow Street, and their mailboxes are all scattered up the street. Um, there is a parking lot be across the alley from this piece of property here. Um, I don't think the sidewalk would end in a chain link fence. Okay. And I've been given permission to landscape that because I plant trees in the neighborhood. Okay, but that's why you're in opposition. But I guess, but but John, I mean, you know, the, the, what we're really talking about is Pillow Street, right? Right. Is, is only in Pillow Street, and he, he wants to pay money to the fund that ultimately we would you know, let the whole block be done instead of just doing his little portion of it. He's, but he's willing to pay whatever the fee is now per foot times 100 feet is 15000 something dollars, I think is what it's $150 per square foot, yeah. so, I mean, linear foot, rather, sorry. It's not a, an inexpensive donation. I'm not trying to make his case, but, but it, what I'm trying to get a sense for is your perspective on his point in, is that that 100 feet is not as impactful as the whole block. It really should be the whole block, and therefore he'd rather pay. But you'd rather have him a sidewalk. Yes, I would rather have the sidewalk. Any other I questions for the opposition? Necessary. Okay. And I would like to make one quick of course. point. He mentioned the lot was 42 feet wide. It's only 41 feet wide, so I don't know okay. if that one foot. Right. Okay, Different thank you. Segments. Thank you for being thank here. You thank you. Very much. I'm assuming uh, we're going to hear now from the applicant again, unless the councilperson wants to wait last. Last, okay. Applicant, please come back. And this is rebuttal time, so please respond to what they said. Okay. Well, as I said, I, you know, for the record, I'm, I'm not opposed to sidewalks. I'm not against them. I've paid in to a lot of the funds. I'm developing and building things around Nashville and where it's appropriate. Um, where we feel is appropriate, rather. We, uh, we pay into the fund. Um, just to use an example of where the, from Belmont, from my house in 12th South area, all the way through um, uh, Green Hills into the Lipscomb area. We now, because of the fund, because we've been paying that, I can actually walk all the way to Lipscomb Elementary close to there where my parents live, and we can walk through the sidewalks, and it goes from from one side to the other. Well, the sidewalks in the Hillsborough Village area were built 100 years ago under Hillary House's administration. Now, but Lipscomb is recent. Well, they've just finalized that. So since they've lived there, uh, since I've lived there for eight years, we haven't been able to get a connected street right. or sidewalk all the way through. What I'm saying is they've bridged the gaps. But that area that is going happen. to be very densely populated with lots of amenities. So, you know, I think that's what the opposition has said, and that's what the council person most likely will say, that, look, you know, there's going to be a ton of foot traffic in this area, and we need sidewalks in every part. There's, is it, so this is a coffee shop, too. Is, so don't you think a sidewalk is important outside of a coffee shop that does not look like it has any separate parking outside of what's on the street? It does have a sidewalk that goes th through that block, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Um, I guess I'm also building houses on, on Pillow up the street, and there was, wasn't an opposition um, towards that. And so I this, feel is like a perfect exam that. this is a perfect example of this isn't a one-off project. You're going to be building other projects in the area. So this organization, SNAP, who's been around, as we heard, for 30 years, sure. and your council person who um, has served recently, you know, I would think it would be in your best interest to kind of, you know, talk to the concerns of the neighborhood association and the council person, particularly if you want to do things in the future there too, because, you know, they have a big voice, right? Sure. So what's wrong with building the sidewalk just as they proposed, as the city proposes? Well, I mean, that's, that's why I was, that's why I'm here. I, that was our first, you know, this is our first hurdle to figure sure. out what all we can build on the property. Okay. Any questions for the applicant? Okay. Thank you. We're going to hear from the duly elected council person of District 17, Councilman Colby Sledge. Please come forward and tell us about this particular case. 
Thank you, board, and thank you, as always, uh, for your service. Um, so uh, rarely will you see me in front of you on a sidewalk variance case, um, and I have to be perfectly honest with you, rarely have I been irritated more by a sidewalk variance request than this one, and there's a couple of reasons why, and they have been sort of hit on. One of which is, as I put in the email, this is a highly trafficked area. This is essentially the start of, if you wanted to call it, the arts and business portion of Wedgwood Houston. As you can see on the southern side, there's a church, there's actually affordable housing that SNAP purchased 30 years ago and is um, renovated and is held um, that is just south of there. And then to the north, the chain link fence that is being referred to is a parking lot that has been, <laughs> used to have a literal tank on it that sat there for years. Um, the parking lot is for Bastion, which is one of the most popular and trafficked restaurants in the entire city. Um, so the reason the sidewalk wasn't built at the time of the, of the chain link fence or the parking lot is because nothing has changed over there. There's been no zoning change, there's been no request. Um, south of this area, a Pillow Street is the poster child for why we needed a sidewalk bill in Nashville. Um, the developers of that block will tell you and have told me they think that there should have been sidewalks required for that block. That block fully redeveloped. I've been in the neighborhood for nine years, so Bill's just barely ahead of me. Um, that, that block right there was, quite frankly, a, a very... Um, is a difficult block to deal with from a public safety issue. Um, so they went first because quite frankly, the properties were the most devalued in the entire neighborhood. So when they went two on one, two on one, two on one, no, the sidewalks weren't built. We couldn't do anything as a neighborhood about those because the zone changes weren't occurring. There were no requests for variances. We had no voice. Um, however, there are two properties just to the south of those that are SPs that the neighborhood had a large voice in talked about the design, the affordability, what would happen there, and as part of those SPs, sidewalks are required. And sidewalks will be built for both of those SPs because we're quite frankly trying to right a wrong that was done on Pillow Street over the last five years. I will also add that it has been very frustrating in dealing with the applicant because I have asked three times, what is the need for the variance? And there has been no feedback to me that indicates what is planned to be built, what the use could be, because this is MULA. I mean, there's a variety of uses that could be in. And I've tried to get an understanding of what is the case for the sidewalk variance. And I, time and time again, I was not provided the case for that sidewalk variance. The coffee shop you're looking at across the street was a former Methodist church in the area. Um, a friend of ours, Mike Hodge, in fact, was out of that church. And that's how Mike started in the neighborhood and helped start SNAP with Bill. They built their sidewalk when that entity, which was a nonprofit, turned it into a social enterprise business. They built the new sidewalk and dedicated the right of way to the new standard with no complaint whatsoever. And what irritates me further is that when, I'm, when asked by the board, what is the grade change? Is the grade change similar? And the applicant is not able to articulate that. I pulled it up in 15 seconds on the parcel viewer. It's a 12 foot grade change on the other side of the street from the corner that you're looking at now to the back of their property. This is not just one property. This is 150 feet of frontage in the most trafficked part of the neighborhood in a neighborhood that desperately needs sidewalk. And the sidewalk that's being referred to by the applicant, I am very familiar with because it occurs right after the edge of the district I represent. And I know Council Lady Allen has worked the better part of five or six years to get that sidewalk in. We don't have five or six years to wait to get 150 feet of frontage in one of the most trafficked portions of this neighborhood and in this portion of the district. I can tell you I've been trying to work on one street in this neighborhood to get, the, to get essentially 900 feet of linear sidewalk. We ain't gonna see those funds for years. It's just plain and simple. There is every reason to build this sidewalk and I have asked for reasons that there aren't and I've been yet to be presented with them. Mm -hmm. Is there any questions for the council person? You know, um, and again, I'm trying to figure out the what the planning department had recommended, and and I know what I know what you want. I think, uh, but the Humphrey side, which has a nine foot sidewalk that goes to the curb, uh, and it looks like all the way down, the the planning department at the, has basically said that's consistent with the street, and they didn't see a change necessary 
there. Do, are you agreeing on, with that on the Humphrey side? You just want them to bring the pillow side up to code with the sidewalk? Right, yeah, I'm okay. fine with the existing. My general rule is don't tear up a sidewalk that works. Yeah, so I'm fine with that. Well, because it, it, it yeah, with, with what we end up doing, it gets right. complicated. <laughs> right. You know, you're like, if, I, if we give a variance, it needs to be very specific to the variances for Humphrey Street to keep the existing sidewalk, but pillow is required to build up to code is what you would prefer us to do. Yes. Okay. Any other questions for Councilman Sledge? Okay. Thank you for being here. We're going to close the public hearing. So my observation is, you know, Councilman Sledge has been here for most meetings for the last few years, and sidewalk requests and short-term rentals are very popular. But he basically said, oh, snap, right? You know, he's, he's upset. He's, he's angry about this. And this is a residential area, and I think... If a council person, this is kind of the opposite of the Ewing Doctrine, um, says that a sidewalk really should be built um, and states the reasons why, given the number of businesses, and we heard about Bastion and coffee shops and furniture stores and Apple Music, that to me, um, this is a no-brainer that, you know, that part needs to be built. What do you all think? Yeah, I, th I think that's fine. The, the, um uh, you know, it, and it, to go back to the reason that it was on consent originally is that it is a, not an unusual situation for this type of property to be on the consent agenda, uh, again, without objection, and the fact that there are objections, and, and particularly uh, uh, neighbors, direct neighbors, and uh, the council member, uh, I, I don't think it's an unreasonable request for what the council member asked. Do you have a motion? Um, I'll move that we um, approve the variance for Humphrey Street to keep the existing sidewalk uh, on Humphrey Street provided that it be repaired and uh, maintained as fully ADA compliant and that the pillow um, street uh, be required to install sidewalks per new metro code. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Ms. Slam, next case. Mr. Chairman, before we move on to the next case, case 2008-2019-022 uh, uh, was originally on the consent agenda and was pulled due to some opposition. Um, the opposition has withdrawn their opposition, so if, if the board sees fit, that can be revoted on now. So 022 on Nolansville Pike. So um, without objection, uh, we are putting that back on the consent agenda. Is there a second? Okay. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. Okay. Back to the regular meeting. Next case for the board to consider is case 2019-004 involving property at 5914A Morrow Road. On the zoning map here, you will see the zoning as R6. Aerial photography shows you the surrounding areas. Uh, before you now is a site plan showing the proposed construction on this property, as well as photos showing you the current conditions of the property uh, as well as across the street and up and down the street. This was request is for a sidewalk variance to construct two family homes without building sidewalks or paying into the fund. Uh, is there anyone here in opposition to this case? Uh, seeing no opposition, the appellant will now have five minutes to make his desired presentation to the board. Please identify yourself by name and address before making your presentation. Hello, uh, my name is Sohel Rahimi and the address is 5914 Mara Road. Uh, thank you for your time. I'm here to uh, discuss my case. Uh, my goal is to build a new sidewalk, but I would like to maintain five foot of sidewalk uh, to comply with my neighbors. Um, the Metro has requested to build an eight foot up sidewalk rather than five foot. Uh, I've walked that street and I've taken pictures of existing and new construction uh, uh, building sites on that road. And uh, f for what I was able to observe, all those uh, sites have five foot of sidewalk. So uh, my goal is to build a new sidewalk and maintain the existing 
width of five foot. Okay, questions for the applicant. Um, well, I'll start off by reading. We have an email from uh, Council Lady Mary Carolyn Roberts, and she says, I'm writing in regard of case 004. They're asking uh, not to have to build or pay into the sidewalk fund. I know what you just said. I'm asking that they build the sidewalk because they're paying into the fund. Is it going to necessarily help my neighborhood? I don't see any hardship that will allow them not to pay or build. So what we're arguing over is should you have to build the kind of new sidewalk? Ms. Lamb, tell us what the sidewalk ordinance says as far as the kind of sidewalk you have to build today. The sidewalk that you have to build today, I'd have to uh, look at the ordinance that involves a... A grass strip in any... A grass strip, and I'm looking to see exactly how wide that is, but approximately a five-foot grass strip mm -hmm. and an eight-foot sidewalk. Four. Four feet, four feet of grass strip. Four feet of grass yeah, strip, mm -hmm. eight-foot sidewalk. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking while I'm trying to talk to you. And so um, this is one of those cases that, and we've heard this a lot, board members, that someone says they're just doing this so they could connect to the old-fashioned existing sidewalks and you know, not have this jog that you know, if you build a four foot grass strip and then the sidewalk, it doesn't kind of flow with the existing sidewalk. So, although this looks like it has a two foot grass strip. So. It's a, it's a, it's a four foot. It four. Oh, it has four right now? Yes. Oh, plan? Okay. But the planning department says it's a four foot grass strip and five foot sidewalk currently exists. Okay, so it kind of would, so what's your argument? I mean, it would still connect. There would not even be a zigzag here if it's already a four foot grass strip. They're just asking I'm you. I'm not to. arguing the, I'm, all I'm just saying is to allow me to maintain the four foot strip of grass mm -hmm. and allow me to build a brand new sidewalk of five foot width what's instead wrong with, of eight What's wrong foot. with eight? It doesn't comply with the neighborhood. Well, it doesn't comply with the law, which is why you're here today. Because if you basically could just build a four-foot sidewalk or five-foot sidewalk, you wouldn't be in front of us. You're asking us to do something that the law says you shouldn't, you, you're supposed to do, right? Absolutely. You're saying the law says this, you want to do this. I absolutely understand uh, what the law says, um, what I just uh, uh, was able to observe on that street with all new, brand new constructions. Uh, they are maintaining five foot of sidewalk. I'll be the only construct, uh, you know, I'll be the only uh, individual constructing an eight foot of sidewalk. Uh, why would I have to be the only one obeying the law, whereas... Because the law has changed in the last year and a half, and so from that day that sidewalk bill passed forward, everyone has to build these eight feet, eight foot wide sidewalks. That's why. Okay. Questions for the applicant, board members? No. Okay. Anything else to add? Okay. We'll close the public hearing. Discussion. Case. Okay. Council Lady Roberts' concern in her email was the um, not paying into the fund and not building a sidewalk. So he's suggested he's going to build a sidewalk, but not eight feet. He wants to build five feet. And there's really no hardship given why he can't build eight feet. That is outside of he just doesn't want to. No, there's not a hardship according to planning. Uh, there's no stormwater issue and no topographical issue that would prohibit him from doing that. And I, to me, given that, my sense is he should build the sidewalk. Okay. Do you want to make a motion? Uh, I make a motion that we deny the variance. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Passes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, before we move into the next case, I've suspected strongly that you might want to take just a moment to recognize a member in our audience who had a case on our business earlier today. Um, I'll hand that off to you. Oh, you know, I, having grown up here in Nashville, one of the joys of childhood was going to Greer Stadium and going to the Sounds baseball games. You know, I probably went to more Sounds games than movie theater uh, back in the day. And um, just an icon of entertainment. I mean, way before we were It City, way before we had Predators or Titans, we had the Nashville Sounds. And we were all proud of it. And 
just creating kind of an atmosphere. And I was thinking of the Oak Ridge Boys singing Elvira during the seventh <laughs> inning stretch, the sound debts. I mean, Larry Smitto, who is in here in the audience today, um, his case got approved on consent, but was just, we all owe a debt of gratitude to him for entertaining us and bringing sports here to Nashville. And like I said, it is, it's an honor that you're with us. I uh, compare you to a great Nashvilleian from 100 years ago named Tony Sudicum, who owned most of the movie theaters and bowling alleys in Nashville and entertained many generations of people. So Mr. Smitto, thank you for everything that you have done. Bowling is a fun sport, though my Commodore women's bowling team has won two national championships. So uh, thanks for uh, giving places for people to practice and play. So thank you, thank you for being here, Mr. Smitto. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I would also point out that Councilmember Davis has shown up, so I believe he might want to address the board at this point before we move on to the next case. Okay, Councilman Davis, District 5, please join us. And uh, I know you have a few cases on the agenda, and we'll... Because um, a Nashville icon is here, maybe the chairman will be in a great mood. <laughs> He's always in a good mood, but maybe he'll be in a really great mood now. You guys want me to go or wait till the chairman gets back? He's back. Oh, he's back? Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Councilman Davis, sorry, welcome back. Um, well, so what's, what are you here for today? Well, I'm here for three cases, um, but there's really two that are very important to me. They're all important, but there's one, um, case number 016. Um, um, we had to move it um, because the unexpectedly the um, applicant had to leave, mm -hmm. and I couldn't represent him, but I am his councilman. He lives in my district, and the homes that he's building are right across the street from the house he lives in uh, with his family. Well, his, his son is on the way. You know, his spouse is pregnant. And so he's going to be living there across the street with his, with his family in about maybe four weeks or maybe six weeks. Um, but the applicant, um, Mr. Kesey, has lived in the neighborhood for over four years. He builds great houses. And the great thing about this is he's willing to do some minor repairs already. He'll explain that when he comes up. Mm -hmm. But the way that the sidewalk is, that is suggested to be done will look very, uh, wouldn't look very good. And so I'm asking for him to be allowed, and he'll tell you those basic repairs that he is going to make, make those very basic repairs and be waived out of the um, sidewalk ordinance and the Luffy. Mm -hmm. And which his basic repairs on those two lots, which he'll show you, will look a lot better than what is currently proposed. Okay. So I'm going to try my best to stick around for that one. As, and, your, as, as your colleague glares at you who passed the sidewalk bill, uh, Council Lady Henderson, she <laughs> went. <laughs> well, Angie is very intelligent and very smart, and she's a great colleague. You know, but this 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 place always has already has sidewalks, yeah. and Mr. Kesey's um, repairs will make it look a lot better. Okay. You know, and what's, what's the next case? Uh, the next case, um, it's on Douglas. Um, I don't know what happens. One of those funny H HPR weird cases. And I've talked to the neighbors there recently, and they have no issue with this case. I've not gotten complaints with this owner or with this Airbnb. So I would, lo I would love for you guys to have mercy and um, also see if we can help them get their So this permit. is case 028 board members on Douglas. That is correct, sir. Okay. And anyone else? Or is that? I think the other one went home. Okay. And so... Any questions for Councilman Davis about the cases that he spoke about? Okay. Thank you for being here. Thank you. 
Ms. Lamb, what's next? The next case for the board to consider is case 2019-016 regarding property located at 1104 A and B North 8th Street. And this is a case that Councilman Davis just spoke about. Um, the applicant here is requesting a variance from the sidewalk. Uh, and will the applicant please come forward? Uh, requesting a variance from the sidewalk requirements to construct two single family homes. On the zoning map here, you will see that the property is uh, zoned SP. Aerial photography shows you the surrounding areas, the surrounding homes. This is the site plan before you, showing you the proposed construction at this property. And finally, photograph showing you the condition, current conditions of the property as well as across the street and up and down the street. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 16? Seeing none, the appellant will now have five minutes to make your desired presentation to the board. Please uh, d be sure to identify yourself by name and address before addressing the board. My name is Vernon Kesey. Uh, my address is 1101 North 8th Street. Um, the address in question is 1104 North 8th Street, uh, where I previously lived. Um, so I built uh, 1101, 1103, um, and now I'm doing 1104 and 1105 across the street. So I live there, and uh, all the people there are my neighbors, and they're my friends. Um, and so um, if you look at the sidewalks that's there the, on the left picture, uh, it's in pretty bad shape. And I have absolutely no problem with fixing the sidewalk. Um, probably about three quarters of it needs to be uh, replaced. Uh, the houses on the on the second lower picture there, uh, on the right side, uh, from the white truck going back are already new. Uh, what I'm proposing to do is about from where that little gravel <coughs> space is there on the uh, lower right picture there is just replace all of it, which is about three quarters uh, of the two lots. Um, but I'd like to do it basically in the way that it is now, instead of jetting out. Because right, right now, there is a one foot grass space, and we would be going to a four foot grass space, which is really odd to, to go from one foot to four foot. It's, it's it's big. It's odd. But you know, I mean, that's for safety I, reasons. And I, I understand, but if you're walking down that sidewalk, not to be argumentative, mm -hmm. if I'm walking down that sidewalk, then I'm jetting out, and then I'm going um, about 40 feet, and then I'm jetting back in, mm -hmm. and that seems pretty dangerous to me. Instead of just continuing to go straight on a new sidewalk, and it, that would be congruent with everything else. That's just my personal opinion. Um, and on top of that, I'm a, I live there and I have to look at it every day and, 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 and my neighbors live there and look at it every, would have to look at it every day. And we're all in agreement that it would kind of be an eyesore. And that's just our opinion and my opinion as a, as a neighbor and a builder. And so I would like to replace basically the three quarters of the sidewalk. And then if you look where the, on the top left there, uh, where the, um, Porta potty is that's the ne the next neighbor where we have like a driveway apron which half is on my lot and half is on their lot so I would be repairing that too so that's an additional ten foot that I would be replacing that's not on my lot and so I would be replacing all that and I'd like to, and so basically I would be replacing the whole length which I have absolutely no problem with doing that and all that would be brand new but. I don't want to do that and pay the in lieu of fee. Questions for the applicant or the councilman? Okay. Um, we're going to close the public hearing. Discussion? Well, I, I think it's a good thing that uh, they're replacing all the sidewalk and even more. And we've had uh, I think it's, it's been a tough uh, decision on our part when it comes to moving the sidewalk over with the grass strip. Sometimes you have council members that say they want you to, and you get these really squiggly sidewalks uh, in neighborhoods that, uh, for a lot of folks, don't make sense, and for some people, uh, they like it. Um, 
but I think when the council member comes and, and says uh, that in this particular neighborhood on this street, it makes sense to have a straight one, I, I, don't, I don't see penalizing the homeowner for not moving it over and yet at the same, I mean, I, I, again, it's yeah. appreciating the law, but I just, so it, it, this is one of those areas where it's just hard. You've got the person who represents yeah. the district and the homeowner and do you have a motion? So, um, you know, I'll, I'll move that, uh, move that we approve the variance uh, from the sidewalk requirement uh, under the condition that the applicant um, maintain uh, completely replace all of the uh, sidewalk that uh, is, as he said, three quarters of his property that needs replacing in addition to the 10 feet on the neighbor's property that uh, was testified to here and that the uh, sidewalk be uh, ADA compliant uh, per the Planning Commission's recommendation, which I think in this case it's not on a corner, so it's, I don't think it applies, but uh, that is one of the uh, Conditions and as a further condition that the right of way for a future sidewalk to future standards be uh, provided. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Aye. Four to one. Okay. Congratulations, Miss um, Lamb. Next case. Thank you. The next case for the board to consider is case 2019-027 regarding property located at 1700 8th Avenue South requesting a variance from setback requirements to install a monument sign. Zoning map here shows the split zoning of the property is CS and R6. Aerial photo of the property gives you a sense of the surrounding area. Site plan showing you the proposed um, I guess the proposed construction where the sign will go. And then finally the photograph showing you the current conditions of the property as well as across the street and up and down the street. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 27? No. Has this sign already been, has this sign already been installed? Uh, yes, if you look, uh, so Mr. Taylor, if you look up on the top left. forgiveness here instead of permission? Yeah, that's, that's what, no, no, actually it's not. It's not, that's it's not it's installed per the permit. We didn't realize how big of a problem we had until after the fact. Okay. It's just too well, low, it's not visible. Existing, yeah, we'll, so. we'll, wait a minute, we'll get to that, but yes. Okay, so Ms. Lamb, anything else to add? Uh, nothing else to add for the case, except the appellant will need to identify himself by name and address before making your presentation, you'll have five minutes. Okay. Certainly, my name is Clay Curtis with Premier Signs, 1720 Ed Temple Boulevard. The colleague here is? My name's Chris Lovett, and I'm uh, with the Enterprise Rent-A-Car, and I'm at 3249 East Lake Drive in Nashville. Okay, so you said there was some sort of mix-up with the permit and the sign, so no, what? To clarify, and thank you for having me, what we've got is, uh, uh, our hardship is, is topographical. So this uh, property slopes deeply. Before you get into the hardship, back. you have a sign that you already put up. Yes, sir. We so pulled a permit and we installed uh, the sign per the permit. What to was the so unclear about our permits that you couldn't figure out how to where to place the sign? No, sir. The, the sign is in compliance with the permit. So why Everything, are you here? I'm here because actually it wasn't until after the fact, is after the sign is installed, uh, after we're looking at it, the sign is actually not visible from the street. His clients are having troubles finding the property uh, itself. Our current, our, our customers cannot find us. Okay, so I know you go to a lot of your customers, right? You we do, we, we do pick them up. So Ms. Lamb, um, this sign appears to me to be basically touching or almost touching the sidewalk. Is that in the proper place. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the proper setback for a sign, a monument sign of this nature is would be 15 feet from the property line. So that sign is not out of compliance? Sir, as the permit states here, uh, it's two foot setback on this one if we were to keep the maximum height of 30 inches, two foot six. But I don't is, even, that's not even two feet, that's not even two inches. So how did that get put up the wrong way? The, the sign itself is actually, uh, a difference. Well, let's cut to the chase. It's not supposed to be there. You're saying it is. It's not. Hey, supposed he, to be. I, I, I think I know he's saying this is a compliant sign. He's it's just he doesn't like where it is. Yeah. It, it, the, they they put up a short. This sign is Miss, a Miss short Liam, <laughs> Is this sign? Does this sign meet the current setbacks? Is this where you're wanting to keep the sign? 
Like this? this? This sign, the final has already been called in and it's already been inspected. This is, yes, this is the, the placement of the sign is, is actually to code. We just we want to raise it. So that you want a different sign. It. No, you want to. You want to. You want to. I want to take a, that existing sign. I want to raise right. it. It's compliant inches. now because it's a short sign and it's a very in a short location, and that's why it can be two, two foot. You want to raise it. When you raise it, it's got to sit back further. And because that, of cars pulling in and out and traffic. So that's the issue that we're getting. Correct, to. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Once you raise it up, it's got to go back because they don't want to block the busy Eighth Avenue. You know, people coming. Out. Sure, and I and I actually had presented many photographs to kind of show you all the different points of view that it, it, by raising it 24 inches, it wouldn't impede on anybody's vision on pulling in or out of that. Based on what? Well, do you have a traffic consultant or? Based on just do you have being some able to renderings? See, I, I do have actually. Well, as far as renderings, no, sir. I have actual photographs that I had submitted. But how to, are we supposed to kind of pretend it's 24 inches higher? Using, uh, okay, agreed that I, I was caught with that one, that I do not have an actual rendering that would show where it would land uh, visually. Now, it, what, what you see there is, is 30 inches tall, off of grade. So we'd literally be adding about maybe a... a, a so there's a photograph in the packet that looks like, I don't know, is that a post behind the sign? If you scroll down about halfway through your packet, what you gave us, there's an up-close photograph of the sign, and it looks like it's got a post behind it. Oh, that's the actual entry gate to the uh, property itself? And yes, that's... Uh, I'm trying to get an idea of the height that you're seeing. Of the height that I'm asking for, and I appreciate that. Um, it's, and I apologize, I, I, I did get caught with that one. You would, uh, you would end up raising it almost the entire black area of the, okay. of the top of the sign. So the bottom the, of the sign would likely come to the, at the top of that small correct. post? Correct. Okay. So one of, the, one of the examples that you showed us is a little bit further down the road the Tennessee Teachers Credit Union, but their sign is further back on the property. That sign, as far as I know, at least when it was put up, is in compliance. So that is, it looks like it's a good five and feet away from the sidewalk. If we move that sign back, it's gonna be in the middle of our parking lot. Well, I understand that, but and you, I, you're showing this as an example, but I don't think And I do right. have a rendering, it must not have made it to your oh, packet if you don't that. have yes, it. That's what and it doesn't show the topographical challenge that they're up okay, against, but, but it would at least give you an okay. idea. Yeah, let's see that. So, well, I, I guess, you know, I, I drive down 8th Avenue a lot, and I, Drove by it to see, because I remember you all being on the agenda before when you got the variance for your parking mm -hmm. on the back. And. Oh, wait, well, first of all, I'm sorry. And this does not even look like your location. Where is that? That's the only computer generated rendering not, I have. This is like some. I don't know what that is. <laughs> all it's not 8th Avenue. It's all I have as far as okay, well, that's, artistic rendering. That's really not helpful at all. But, I, I, you know, I, I did see the sign, and it took a, it took a little looking. It's not as obvious as other. Uh, signs, but it, it you can see the sign, and I guess the question to me was, why, you know, why are you seeking this variance instead of putting up, you know, the building signs or other other uh, options to to let people know where you are. The, the challenge is that if we put something on the front of the building, you're not going to be able to see us going driving south from the city. That you're, you're just not gonna be able to see it. Grimey's is in the way. Um, if, even if we move it to the other corner Grimey's, by the billboard. Grimey's moved. Oh, well, the, the first Grimey's. Yes. Oh, you mean the bookstore? Yeah. Okay. So it blocks it on, on that side, and then the, on the other side, you can't see us coming um, north. That's the, really the only place that we could put it. And it's really, honestly, the, the extreme drop of, from the sidewalk. If, in fact, we were 30 inches ab above the sidewalk, um, which is what you're talking as far as a safety issue of being able to see left and right when you're pulling out of there, if it was, in fact, 30 inches off of that, it would be 10 to 14 inches taller than it is now. So if we pushed it back a little bit further but let you go higher up, I mean, would that still accomplish what you're looking for? 
it, it'll be literally in the middle of the parking lot. There's no way we could get down to the back parking lot that way. You see where actually when you're coming in, that property actually turns extreme right. Yeah, you make it right, hard right. That, that location of the, uh, of the sign, there is no room to go any more back. You're actually taking away their driveway to, do, to pull it off. It goes st straight to the right as, as soon as you pull in there. You can even see the arrow there, but there's actually- Yeah, Miss Lane, flip to that other picture that I think, yes, okay, there. So that arrow to the right, which is just a triangle, that's kind of where you go to- Yes, sir. And the sign is kind of just to the right of that? Yes, sir. So that's what you said it would be in the middle of the parking lot? Mm -hmm. In their driveway, yes, sir. And, but, you know, as Mr. Taylor said earlier, you have that big white face on your building with no signage. I could put one there, but you're still not gonna be able to see it's coming from the city. The, the building, the new development that's to the right of it, you see it on the other photo, mm -hmm. they're built all the way out to the, to the sidewalk there. You've also got the, the Grimies on the other side. It's just visibility. It's, okay. it's a well, matter of seconds yeah, where you have I, visibility on this. So I have a question because, you know, we approved you being yes, able to use this case. You remember a few months ago. Yes, sir. And so this is the second time you're coming to us and asking for something. How, you didn't know back then that was important with the signage or just all of a sudden you're now realizing oh this isn't this sign isn't you know adequate for our new location here with what we had we we thought we had enough height mm -hmm. in there to be visible it, the the buildings to the right were, n were not even there when we were developing the property that stuff when we're sitting there discussing with our clients what to do with the signage there the building wasn't built yet that we didn't know that coming from the 8th Avenue side, there was going to be a, a flash of visibility. Um, so it's, it's not until we actually had the, the foundation drilled into the ground, anchor bolts in the ground, mm -hmm. and this thing installed where we realized we have a visibility issue. And then of course amplified by as soon as he starts getting clients mm -hmm. coming through the office telling him, we passed this thing four and five times before we actually found it. We, we also have some customers here to verify that as well. Let's hear from the happy enterprise customers. Come <laughs> forward. Like I said, I thought your slogan is, we'll pick you up. <laughs> so I want to hear from these neighbors that... Come on, sit down. That oppose the dog. Oh, okay. So rental cars I'll better remind than... Them of that. Yeah. Okay. Rental cars State are your good. name, address, why you're here. Hi, Linda Hartman, 702 Wedgwood Park. Okay. Uh, don't we don't take all of my time. Okay. We don't have any problem with them raising the sign. I was in their parking lot this morning, and the sign is liter almost literally on the ground um, with the new new condos that are very close to it, it, you absolutely cannot see it going into town. We don't have a problem uh, with Even our pesky it. red BZA sign is blocking part of the enterprise sign in that photograph. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Chairman so please, and members of- Name address again, please. Of Doc McDowell, uh, 702 Wedgwood Park, uh, um, uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the uh, BZA, uh, I'm here to support Enterprise. I, I think uh, uh, they're, they're a good corporate citizen as far as I have uh, noted in my business dealings with them. I think they employ a lot of people in the city. And of course, uh, I think they've done a lot of beautification and improvement of this property. I think it would only be fair uh, that they'd be allowed to raise this sign in as much as uh, there are many other signs that uh, are equally uh, raised uh, further into the Skyway of Nashville on this particular corridor. So I support uh, the applicant's request and would encourage the BZA to uh, approve it. Uh, we, of course, uh, uh, reside, Linda and I, in the uh, Wedgwood Park Complex, which consists of condominiums, condominiums and uh, townhomes. Um, Eighth Avenue needs this kind of improvement. Uh, we're all in favor of it. And I think in order for them to do the business that they need to do in this city and to generate uh, income and salary for their employees, it would be a good thing that they can have more visibility. Okay, very good. Questions for the applicant? I mean, the, the supporters of bigger, higher signs and 
8th Avenue. Please come back. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Okay, yeah. Okay, so you basically are almost out. So wrap it up in 30 seconds and... Um, I also want to point out our, our beautiful eight-foot sidewalks that we have installed. <laughs> Okay. If that makes a difference. So you're, what you're asking is simply to raise this sign. How many inches? 24 inches. A minor sign. adjustment. Yes, yes, ma'am. This thing uh, would, it, at, right now it is two foot six off of grade. So that's the sloped dirt at, the, at its highest point. We are just proposing to raise it 24 inches from where it exists right now. There's going to be no changes to the style or illumination. And, and do, do I understand that the, the need to raise it is the result of the buildings that were built to the right after you installed it initially? Is that that's the only reason? The only reason that we didn't notice the, mm -hmm. the issue until after the fact, yes, sir. So if those buildings weren't there, you wouldn't be here, you wouldn't need this? Not likely. If you had good visibility coming from either direction, then, then no, sir. I mean, the sign is up off of the ground. It is illuminated. But it's, uh, it is a flash. When you're driving past this property, it is a flash that you actually get a chance to see this sign because of the buildings to the left and right. Yes, sir. Okay. Any more questions of the applicant? Okay. We're going to close the public hearing. We do have an email from Councilman Sledge who said he was neutral on this request. So, discussion. I'm willing to give him 24 inches. I think they've made an ar a legitimate argument. Uh, for a hardship. Okay. Any commission? I, I agree with that. Okay. I, I think they didn't okay. know about let's, this building. Let's have a motion. I make a motion. We grant uh, a variance and allow them to raise this sign 24 inches from its current location. Same sign, same design. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Good Thank luck. you very much. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Ms. Lamb, what's next? <clears throat> next case is 2019-032, regarding property at 3711 Ezell Road, requesting a variance from setback requirements. Will the applicant for 032 please come forward? Is the applicant for the Ezell Road property here? Gil Gilberto Alverdo. Okay. I'll let we defer this to the next meeting. Yeah. Motion's been made to defer to the next meeting. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Okay. Next case. And will the case number for 033 please? Was there, was there anybody in opposition to that 032? Was there anyone here in opposition to case 032? Okay. okay. Just, just in case that you said there were. No, there was. I say just in case the applicant sure, was in the restroom or something yeah. and comes back. Sure. Okay. We know that no one is leaving thank because you. of the deferral. Okay. Ms. Lamb. Next case is case 2019-033 regarding property at 5738 Cane Ridge Road requesting a variance from the sidewalk requirements to construct a new sanctuary without building sidewalks or paying into the fund. Zoning map, map here shows you the zoning of the property is AR2A. Aerial photo of the property gives you a sense of the surrounding area. Before you now is the proposed site plan, of, or the site plan rather, of the proposed construction at this location. And finally, photographs showing you the current conditions of the property as well as up and down the street and across the street. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 33? Seeing no opposition, the appellant uh, is here. Uh, Dave Burser, I believe, is here on behalf of the appellant. And we'll, you'll now have five minutes to make your presentation. Please be sure to identify yourself by name and address. Hi, yes, my name is Dave Purser with Purser Architecture and Design. My address is 2819 Columbine Place, Nashville. Okay, why are we here? Um, we're here. We um, noted that staff um, approved this with two conditions. Um, I think the, I've, representing the church, they are concerned about the right of way dedication and that along Cane's, uh, Cane Ridge Road, um, you're looking at like a six foot bike lane, eight foot planning strip, and then a six foot sidewalk, which seemed to be you know, coming close to a 20 foot right of way dedication. And I, I don't think they agree to that. Um, there is a hardship, a uh, natural rock bluff at the south end of this. And if you'll maybe go back to the aerial photograph, you'll note that the Cane Springs Road um, already has relatively new sidewalks. If you'll note, they kind of end there at Cane Ridge Road. 
and as you go south along the property is, is, is where the hardship occurs. There's a rock bluff that's oh, chest high, um, really right off the edge of the road within, I'd say, four or five feet. And it's going to be really difficult to build um, a sidewalk there without, um, well, massive work. But also, the, the sidewalk doesn't really appear to, would not connect. There's a, a utility, power, overhead power line utility that, that's next to this property. Um, so it's, it's a sidewalk that's not really going um, so what to do the you neighborhood. So we have a recommendation, of course, from planning, but what are you proposing? Um, we're proposing um, that the board recommend, uh, that approve without conditions. Approve, so no build, no uh, no paying into the fund? No dedication of right-of-way. No dedication of right-of-way. Uh, no maintaining the sidewalk. Well, I believe that I don't think there was an issue with maintaining the existing sidewalk that was that's already there on Cane Springs Road. So you don't want to build a sidewalk, you don't want to pay into the fund, and you don't want to dedicate the right-of-way? Um, uh, correct. Mm -hmm. So how are we going to get all these sidewalks in Nashville that we need? in these populated areas. Um, you're not going to build or pay into the fund. I mean, they only recommend, planning recommended dedication to right away. I know. Well, you got, I mean, planning's recommendation was, I thought, very generous. I did too. To, and all they want is just dedication on the right away. But um, and it's, it's correct. And again, um, and all you had the, to do, you would have been on consent if you had dedicated to the right of way, but here you are. Uh, correct. And I think there's just concern that they're giving that land away and it's a wide strip. It's giving it away. This is dedicated to the city, the public good of people walking and biking. It's not like giving away to some random private <laughs> developer. I, I understand that. And, um, I'm here representing their interests. Of course. Mm -hmm. Well, and I understand I mean, the, the law and, and, and what it says, and 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 but and, and absolutely empathetic with um, with uh, I think that argument is strongest when people are required to pay into the fund and give the right away. I think that that's a double whammy that that uh, I think is is not uh, correct or fair. Um, it, regardless of what the law says, that's my opinion. Uh, in this case, it, there is a trade. There is a trade of not having to build the sidewalk in order to allow the city at some point in time in the future to, to uh, build uh, a comp more complete street on that Cane Ridge Roadside, which, you know, again, it's not for me to say how you value your, your land, but it's clear from the photograph that there's uh, ample space currently to do that. Um, and so I'm a little bit troubled by that too. Um, and I mean, it, it, it sounds like that what, what you're saying is the church would prefer if the city came in and improved the street so, there, that they would want the city not only to pay for that, yeah. but to also mm -hmm. compensate you too. So, so I have you a, want a double benefit for something the city's gonna do. Okay. Basically, uh, and then asking us to give you something for yeah, nothing now. I have a question of, I have a question of our zoning administrator. So, Mr. Zoning Administrator, if we turn down this request, isn't the legal kind of uh, outcome of this is they would have to pay, build a sidewalk, and basically. Well, they would, they would have to build a sidewalk, right, if we reject this? That's correct. They would have to comply with the law, which requires them to build a sidewalk in this instance to the current standards as passed in the 2017 legislation. So that's, if we turn this down, that's their outcome? Uh, that's my understanding. Again, not having okay. re reviewed yep. particulars, apparently they're not eligible for the fund at this point, and the chief zoning examiner may be able to correct me on that point. Are they eligible for the fund? They are not eligible for the fund. Ooh, so I want to make a comment here. I live very close to this property and I travel that road a lot. I know that we need sidewalks out there very badly. And I know you're representing a client and not yourself personally, that I would have a problem agreeing with your clients that we don't need to build that sidewalk right now because everything is booming out there and we need sidewalks everywhere we can get sidewalks. So I will okay. have a problem so agreeing Ms. with Ms. Sanford, request. who's very involved in this part of the county, um, that's kind of her take on this. So I will give you 
another chance. If you go along with planning's recommendations, then I think um, most of these board members would be agreeable to that. Door number three has a zonk. <laughs> the zonk is you have to build the sidewalks. Um, and if you don't, I don't get four is there people. And the opportunity to defer and oh, that's discuss a good, with my class. Yes, that's another wise choice. So, okay. So, um, is there a motion to defer? How many? Is the next meeting fine? Correct. Okay. I'll move to defer this to the next meeting. Okay. Motion's been made to defer the next meeting. Is there a second? Second. second. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. Good luck. Talk thank to your you, client you. and, like I said, explain to them. I mean, planning is basically saying you don't even have to pay into the fund. Just dedicate the right of way. It's a pretty fair deal. So, we'll thank see, you. We'll see you next time. Okay. Ms. Lamb. Next case is 2019-035, uh, involving property at 59 Lincoln Street, requesting a variance from lot size requirements, setback requirements, and sidewalk requirements to build a single family home without building sidewalks or paying into the fund. Zoning map here demonstrates the zoning of the property is R6. Here you have the aerial photography giving you a sense of the surrounding area. Site plan showing you the proposed construction on this location, and finally the photograph showing you the current conditions of the property, as well as across the street and up and down the street. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 35? Seeing none, uh, the appellant will have five minutes to make your desired presentation to the board. Please be sh sure to identify yourself by name and address before making your presentation. Yes, good afternoon. My name is Andrew Buford, and I'm here for 59 Lincoln Street. Um, my goal is to build an affordable house um, on a small lot that uh, has not been used for a long time. Um, there used to be a house on this lot, and it was burned down in a fire. How long ago was the house built, and when did it burn down? Uh, I was told that it, it burned down in 89, I believe. So okay. was it on this, this tiny lot or was it yes, on the Yes, it was lot? on this lot in the past, yes. Um, and since then, Metro actually took back the property and we bought it at, uh, it was offered to us at By a who? sale. By Metro? By Metro, yes, because um, we own the property next to it. And so we got oh. the first right to purchase it. So. Um, not to speak for Metro, but I'll ask Ms. Lamb. So in those cases that Metro takes property and then gives it to the, or sells it to the adjoining property owner, the intent is really, hey, this is a tiny little lot, probably nobody can build on it. You have the property next door, why don't you just add it on, right? And without knowing the specifics, I can't answer that directly. I know that Metro um, often sells property at tax sales or at, mm -hmm. um, for de uh, delinquent taxes or other potential demolition lawsuits, um, if there is any kind of delinquency there. Uh, but as Mr. Chairman, you've pointed out, presumably they offer to the neighbor first to see what the neighbor wants to do with it to their own property not necessarily without as its own individual lot, but I can't say that with certainty because I don't know okay. anything of the particulars of this case, nor do I generally participate in the sale of the metro okay. land. So you own, so now you own what? what? I no longer own the adjoining property. Oh, I sold so. it. So why didn't you throw this in the sale? Um, it actually happened right at about the same time. And the, the people who wanted to buy it, wanted to buy it without the lot. So I just went ahead and did okay. it. Let me read and to you what the duly elected council person from the 17th District Councilman Sledge has said about your particular request. A request for all kinds of variances, and he's opposed to this, a request for all kind of variances and exceptions to build on a substandard lot on Lincoln Street. Substandard, in parentheses, too small to build on. Lots are throughout the Chestnut Hill Trimble Bottom, and I'm going to be asking planning and zoning for a more comprehensive approach to them rather than a piecemeal one. So that is his take on this. Okay. Um, this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to build an affordable house in Nashville. How, how affordable is this going to be? You're building well, it's house. only going to be, tw sorry, it's only going to be 1,200 square feet. And so how much will that um, cost in dear old Trimble Bottom? Um, the the for sale price will be two fifty. 
Um, and the so house next to it. 250 for a 1,200 square feet house is affordable? Yes, the house next to it sold for 460. How big is that house? That was 2,400 square feet. Oh, that's feet. bigger. Yes, yeah. um, but usually just because it's double the square footage, it's not that's double like the price. That's like saying SUV costs more than a sedan. It should be, yeah. your, your property should be less. Mm -hmm. So, but 250? That's affordable? Really? Yeah, if you look a few doors down. Oh, um, too, you're just so saying blanketly this is affordable. But I, I it's affordable that, compared to everything around it. I'm well, sorry. and that, and, and, and I, I, I appreciate the, the attempt at uh, doing uh, affordable housing, but the, to me, the, the question here is that, that I want to answer it is uh, back to, to Colby, to Council Member Sledges. Uh, Desire, and I, I don't think he's still here, and I wish he was to be able to say what time he would need. But um, I do, I do know that we have had a, a handful of cases, not necessarily in this neighborhood, but in others too, where you have the, this little old historic part of a lot, and it does make sense to have some kind of comprehensive approach to it. Although I will say the the a variance that you are asking for is uh, does make sense on its surface too in terms of, of what you're asking uh, so I guess the question is have you talked with council member sledge and if have you talked to council member sledge I have not then would you uh, be willing to defer this so that you could talk to him and that we could also get a better sense from him of what he really wants in terms of his district uh, and in and, and terms of the approach to these small lots, getting a, a sense of scope, how many there are, and uh, what we have maybe seen uh, down the pike. Yes. Uh, because he, he may come back and say, hey, what you want is perfectly reasonable if you talk it through. But I think that what he's asked us for is to, to look at this, not as piecemeal, but in and, whole. And before you answer that, you're also asking for a, um, not to pay into the side, not to build a sidewalk or pay into the fund? Well, after sitting here for a little while, uh, I've decided to uh, go ahead and pay into the sidewalk. Very good. <laughs> Counselor Henderson. Uh, if you guys will let me build on it, uh, okay. I have no problem so, doing so that. So would it, uh, <laughs> We meet again the uh, the first Thursday of February and the third Thursday of February. How long do you? I don't I, I don't know the councilman's schedule, but would you prefer this to be deferred one meeting or two meetings? Um, uh, um, one meeting is fine. Okay, when, and then if you if you need a or do you think I don't know? This is my first time. I mean, just uh, to point out, one we, meeting is good. Yeah. I'm sorry, did you? I was just going to let the appellant know, in case you didn't, that uh, one meeting would be two weeks and two meetings would be a month. So that's oh. the difference in time. Yeah, two meetings, I'm sorry. Okay. One month would be we'll a month. We'll, I'll make a motion that we defer this until the second meeting of February. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Mm -hmm. Passes. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Good, good Appreciate luck. it. We're to the short term. We are to the short term rental cases. If the board would like to take a brief break, we're waiting for our short term rental inspector. He's okay. on his way over. We'll take a break. Yep. So we'll uh, take a five minute break while we wait for the inspector to appear. Thank you. What? Yeah. I know. Ms. Lamb, let's get started again. Mr. Chairman, the first short term rental case for consideration by the board is case 2018-574 involving property at 1203A Ashwood Avenue. Is the appellant here on this case? Thank you. And is anyone here in opposition to this case? All right. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, the, this um, is an item A appeal, appealing the denial of a short terminal permit due to operation prior to obtaining a permit. Um, Mr. McBroom here is, is here and will make the presentation on behalf of staff. After Mr. McBroom makes his presentation, the appellant will have 10 minutes to make your desired presentation. Please identify yourself by name and address before addressing the board, and then the opposition will have 10 minutes. If you'd like to reserve any rebuttal time, you may do that as well. Good afternoon, board. Um, this came to us through host. Um, they identified the property and sent a letter. Uh, the operation dates of this property were August of 17 through May of 18. There were a total of nine rentals. The application process was begun on 616 of 2017, but not completed. Uh, first, line on, first online activity was 7-8 of 16. <clears throat> the notice uh, was sent on uh, the 10th of March of 18, estimated delivery the 17th. The appeal was filed on September the 12th. No other action was taken. Um, however, the advertisement has been uh, removed and reposted five times and is active as of today, but uh, there were no uh, subsequent rentals. Um, the concern on this property is that um, it isn't eligible for a permit because it's an HPR. So I've, I've got a question for our legal counsel. Um, if the property is not eligible, if, we, if it's known that the property is not eligible because it's an HPR and the owner doesn't own the other house, do we still need to hear the case? Well, technically, the um, the appeal was denied for operation. I'm sorry, the application was denied for operation without a permit. Um, so that is what's before you. That is different from their eligibility with respect to other requirements. So as you know, we generally say you're eligible to apply. That doesn't mean you'll definitely get a permit. I mean, I think it's probably technically up to the appellant if she wants to withdraw her case based on the current say of the law, which says that she is ineligible. But it's ultimately up to the board. To, her question before the board today is if you, if we codes or the zoning administrator erred in denying her permit for operation, which is a separate section of the law. Does that answer your question? Okay. So continue, Mr. McBroom. Anything else? No, Mr. Chairman. So were there any non-permitting complaints against this property? No, sir. Okay. Please start us. Name, address, why you're here. Thank you. Press the bottom button. Just leave it. Okay. Yes? Yes. Okay. I'm Abby Adams. I reside at 1203A Ashwood Avenue, Nashville. Um, so I did start the process um, to get my permit. Um, I was under the impression, and obviously I was mistaken, but I was under the impression that I was approved to go forward with renting and did so. Based on what? Well, I had gone through the process and I had um, the fire marshal come out and take a look. I actually wasn't up to codes and had to add a smoke alarm. I did that, had them come back, and was approved at that point. And when they came to the house and they looked at it and they said, you should be good to go forward. And did you ever get a letter from the city saying you're convinced? I did not and have since learned that I should have. Um, since then, I was notified um, that I was not approved and operating without a permit. So I've started going through that process to right that okay. wrong. So speaking of righting the wrong, you've been renting, so. Well, uh, I, I haven't since March, and I understand that it's been on and off, and I think that's a glitch with the website because I've have took it off a long time. Have you never rented to anyone? No, I mean, I haven't rented since. Okay, so you got the letter, and then you had future bookings. What did you do with those? Well, I haven't rented since I got the letter that. Okay. So did you ever rent short term? Yes. How many? Before times? I realized that I didn't have the permit. Nine. But you haven't rented since March of 18. Whenever I got the letter, when and I was asked to go to court. Well, tell me when you got the letter then. Tell me the last day you rented the property. Actually, I'm sorry, About. I don't. About. Tell me I, the last month you rented Mr. the property. Mr. McBroom said it was May the 18th. Okay. May. okay. And it would have been about that time that I got the, um, I don't know what the proper word is, but the notice to go into court. 
Um, I've since learned, or you know, in the process of that, that there was a letter sent to notify me prior to that that I never received. And in conversations, I think there was a mix up with the address because I'm A and it wasn't okay. sent to A, sure. but nonetheless. And okay. you, you are you are A, right? When I am. And you don't own B? No. Questions for the applicant? Do you have anything else to add? No, only to um, just simply state that um, I'm doing this to supplement my income, mm -hmm. and it's really important to be able to stay in that house to do that. Okay, so as you, I think, know, we don't write those laws. Sure. We're just here to interpret them, and so all that we can do is say after a certain period of time, if we felt that you're in violation, that you can go apply again, and it's up to them to determine your eligibility. So that's what we're here. Okay. Close the public hearing. Discussion. Oh, there's op oh that's right. Come forward. Opposition. All those hands up in the front row. Okay. Please go back in the audience, and you'll have time for rebuttal to respond to. Thank you. Okay, everyone, please state your name, address, and why you're here in opposition to this case. Jenny Destre Cox, 1207D, Ashwood Avenue. Uh, Justin Roddick, 12, 1209 Ashwood Avenue. Rachel Roddick, 1209 Ashwood Avenue. Augustine Kuntz, 1205 Ashwood Avenue. Sandra Lee, 1204 Linden Avenue. And Derek Cox, 1207D, Ashwood Avenue. Reggie Kuntz, 1205 Ashwood. Okay, the Metro National Network is using their wide angle. We have <laughs> seven people here in opposition to, okay, so who's going to get us started? Do you have, you know, uh, to, if you 10 want, minutes collectively? Yeah, right? if you want me to start it off, yeah. uh, basically we, we all live on Ashwood, with the exception of, of our friends on London here, and uh, we, we have been constantly this group has been to the mayor's office we have we have worked with planning or with codes and gone down and, and tried to figure out how to enforce Airbnb and they've just told us hey look there the laws are the laws if they get three strikes they're out and if they operate out without a permit they're denied access to a permit and right now that's the only way we can slow down or police this with the laws that are currently on the books so right well, now let, we're current let me ask you this why is this particular airbnb so objectionable that we, all of you are out down here uh, we, saying uh, that you don't want this to happen no, just, we have several on our street already two of which are directly across the street from our house and from their well, house I understand, but we're talking i can tell you why sir this I, I can tell you why sir because it, it, it was my question. I love you. Um, so, so basically, our problem is is that we were told that that basically that to have an Airbnb and to to get a license to do it, then you have to follow the rules. Mm -hmm. And this is a perfect example of somebody who had zero disregard for the process. So if you if she were to get a permit then she's already proven to us that she is not willing to follow okay. the rules. Well, let me ask you this, and I think this case is a little bit different because she apparently was trying to follow the rules and just she never got the magic letter, you're approved, of course. But we have lots of people that come in front of us that have just a philosophical disagreement with the whole short-term rental law, and I get that. But we're here to talk about this one particular applicant mm -hmm. and why they should or should not be allowed to be in the short-term rental. So I want to hear specific things about what you have seen or heard or why this person should or should not have this. Yes, please. I'm Sandra. Uh, the only concern I had was that whether or not she was continuing to live in, on the property. Okay. <clears throat> Rather than it being a short-term rental that was just open. And we apologize for making you stand up I'm like fine. the planning commission. <laughs> no the planning fine. commission doesn't have chairs. Uh, they don't want you to speak as long. Uh, the, her property, my property backs up to hers. I am a 30 plus year resident of that area wow. and those homes were built mm -hmm. and now we have, uh, she, her lot was sold and they put two, pro mm -hmm. two houses on that property and so the, the neighborhood is changing enough and with the short term rentals that are, are on Ashwood, I can hear them on my street in my backyard. But this particular... Haven't I heard anything from um, Miss Abby's mm -hmm. property? I didn't know that... Um, that she was even renting it. Mm -hmm. uh, I spoke with her before this, before we came up here, and she said that she is 
going to continue to live in it, and she's going to be uh, strategic about who she rents to. So for me, that's, I'm, I'm feeling better about it. I don't have as much of a, a, an issue with it as if it were just open. So are you saying it's the bachelorettes that make all the noise? Oh my and gosh, and the, and the bachelors, they're terrible. Oh man, I didn't know that we had bachelors it's, it's, in this it's town terrible. too. It's terrible, yeah. Yes. Yes, um, I live at 120, I'm sorry, 1205 Ashwood Avenue, which uh, I have a blown up picture of, you can pass it around. My house is the blue house. Mm -hmm. How close it would be uh, to me. Uh, there was a... Yeah, let's see that. And Yes, an incident, whereas uh, she was renting uh, for the week. And of course, it was loud on the front porch and on the back uh, screened-in porch when I'm out in my yard. Uh, in addition... I really thought that she had a permit. I had no idea. I called uh, sometime last year, and I was told that, yes, um, you have to ask your neighbors in the front of you and the back of you well, not and ask, the left you just and the have right. To just notify them. You know, okay, sadly. well, notify, notify them. It's just like sending a letter saying, hey, I'm about to apply. Not, not much you can do. Uh, Mr. Zoning okay. Administrator. Um, how does one tell who has a permit or not officially by looking online? Is there a place that they could do that? The open records portal uh, that the Metropolitan mm -hmm. Government uses for all of its departments and agencies includes a listing of all short-term rental permits, I believe, that have ever been issued, whether presently active or not, and certainly would capture those which are active. Um, that's the place where I think most people go looking for so that sort of thing. So you could go online and tell if your neighbor you actually can, has a fact, permit. However, I can attest that as our building opens at 7.30 every day, there are plenty of folks that come down to see us in person to ask questions about those type of subjects as well. And despite the fact that lots of people come in for lots of different questions, we try our best to see everybody we can with the limited resources we have. Oh, limited resources, but you're doing well with the Coast Department. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess I should have been intelligent enough to maybe look into that. Also, just like oh, no, we no, received... I'm just telling I wanted to say that because I want, a lot of people have that question, and it's fairly easy, I think, to find out. Now. Okay, thank so, um, One thing, just like we receive, you know, the information about this date, we never received any information, and I guess obviously it's because she was never uh, given a legal uh, permit, but I am against it is because it's two doors from me and I know what the noise will be and I am definitely against it. I, I, well, I, I yeah. don't need that. And just, just so you all know the, our, the procedure here, uh, you may have heard me ask the question earlier because in our packet uh, the code staff has told us that the property isn't eligible to, act, to get a permit because right. it's in a horizontal property regime and the owner doesn't own the other house, which the owner stated a minute ago that she didn't. And so, but yet the question that we have was, did she operate without a permit? And she clearly did because she said she did. And so what we have to decide is, because the council, Metro Council has said that uh, homes in this neighborhood, uh, unless they're in a horizontal property regime, are eligible to have a permit. And if they operate without a permit, that they can be um, denied a permit for up to a year and we have the ability here to say how long uh, that penalty is before she can reapply. What I'm telling you guys is, make sure you understand is, when she does reapply, uh, she's not gonna get a permit because she's in a horizontal property regime, she doesn't own the other half. <laughs> so she's not gonna be able to get a permit, and that's why I'd ask earlier, why do we need to actually I, hear okay, the case? I understand. So with, uh, what yeah. I'm saying is it's almost, um, it's almost in everyone's, best interest to say, you know, to have the applicant be able to apply as soon as possible so that she can go down to codes and say, well, no, you're not going to get a permit. I guess the bottom line is whatever, the, whatever answer this board gives on the question that we're asking is when should this person be able to apply based on the current law and the current interpretation of the law by code staff, the points moot because of the HPR. So that, that I just want to make sure you all understand that so that so that we're not caught up in a, you know, you're upset with us because we say she can apply sooner rather than later because, you, frankly, you probably should want that because if we said uh, you can apply 12 months from now, the law may change. So
Sir, I would just like to add one more thing based on that statement. The reason why we're here, regardless of, of whether or not she could be applied, is because we're here to make sure that Metro enforces the laws as they are on the books. Because right now, we've called the police 52 times on the house across the street, owned by Aerial Development Group. They all know it. The mayor's office knows it. Um, there's not one official complaint on that property for the st three strikes you're out rule, not one. So we are here as citizens, taxpayers, who, who every year get an increase in taxes. We, we live in an area that luckily, you know, our property values are going up, but it's very much a hardship for some of the people that have been there for 30 years. And this is just one more, you know, kind of slap in the face. So we are here regardless. No, I, uh, I appreciate of, you, know, you being here. So that, that, that's you. not, not, I hope nothing I've yes. said is, has said you shouldn't be, or, or you shouldn't be. We shouldn't be talking about this issue. I, I, I appreciate everybody that comes out to express that. Um, I will, the, the, and the only comment is that we're not the police, and we we interpret a very small, narrow section, and that's what we see from our citizens is a, a, a big frustration sometimes, thinking that we have more authority to do uh, more than than we do, and and there's not a one-stop shop that uh, for to, in the county, and that's. Yeah. Uh, that's a Metro Council uh, issue, not a board totally. Council we're, we're issue. Totally. <laughs> yes. And Mr. Anyway, Chairman, to the event, it's yes. helpful. We're happy to take questions yeah. on behalf of staff after the hearing, since okay. obviously that's not the board's function at sure. all under any circumstances. We're happy to take every single question, mm -hmm. provide every answer that we can to the extent it's helpful, since you have other cases who are waiting to be heard. Okay. okay. I have one last thing. Yes. Yes, sir. Thank you. Explain to me what do you mean by living? Uh, does living mean that the person has to live in the home when they're renting it out, or can okay. they leave the premises okay. while they're while they're renting it? Okay, a lot of people want to know, Mr. Zoning Administrator, tell us what living in a house. I understand the question to be, do you have to be on the premises while it's being rented out? Although that's not pertinent to this question, since nobody had a permit to operate a short-term rental, I will say that generally the application of law does not require the homeowner to be present at the time it's being rented out to a short-term rental guest. That's never been the law since we put this in place in 2015 at the Metro Council. Mm -hmm. How many days a week would you have to be in your house? I'll be happy to take all questions after this hearing. None of this is pertinent to okay. the case before the board right now. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. We're going to hear from the applicants. Rebuttal time. We appreciate you all being in such large numbers, and um, please stay active. Okay. Applicant, this is rebuttal time. You get to respond to what you just heard. Um, uh, Response-wise, I, I understand the concerns of the neighborhood. I understand some of the incidents that have happened, particularly in the property that is down the street and across the street from some of them. And um, some very specific, very unfortunate um, situations that have happened to um, a family across the street from us. That's not been the case with the people that I have rented to or that I would intend to rent to, which may, as you say, be a moot point anyway. Okay, so th these short-term rental laws get debated by the lawmakers, which is the Metro Council, but I'm curious, what happened to the people across the street? Um, there was a group of men from New York that was staying in one of those houses. Um, they were coming in late at night, uh, were dropped off by an Uber or Lyft. They were very drunk. Um, I have been told they were all New York police officers. Um, one of them busted in the front door of a very um, minority family across the street and was yelling obscenities at them. Um, in a so, very racist manner, okay. and um, so I, I will I say think that we at the BZA have no independent verification of no, these and neither do I. Okay. It was but just, I just wanted to kind of just sure. in general what kind of case it was. Anything else to add? Um, no, just thank you for your time. Okay, close public hearing discussion. You know, I mean, the applicant's not eligible for. A permit, and so I don't know what the right answer is. Part of me says, you know, have that applicant. The, you know, that's we're just deciding if you know. I, yeah, I, I fully know what we're deciding, and it's, and it's not have anything to do with what we've talked about for the last uh, little bit of time. Um, and so that's what's a little frustrating because you know, part of me says, you know, have the applicant be eligible to apply on on Monday and just to get it over with because they're not eligible for a permit. And part of me says, well, I mean, just deny it and. Let them, uh, you know, be eligible a year from now because they're not eligible for a permit. Uh, in that case, the law may change. I mean, I think it's 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 in the best interest of 
the folks that are opposed to have it, to have it kind of ended. But, but again, I, I, I'm frustrated because we're spending time debating something which we know is going to be denied because they're not eligible. Okay. Anyone have a motion or any thoughts? My thought is uh, that we would analyze it the same way we would the many hundreds that have come before us. This is somebody that thought she had a permit. She's not rented since she was notified that she did not actually have the permit. She went through the process. Uh, and the question before us is whether the zoning administrator erred. I don't think that he did, but I think given the facts that we have, she should be eligible to apply for her permit tomorrow. Is that a motion? I'll make that a motion unless or somebody Monday. else has other discussion. Monday. We might I'm sorry, Monday. Okay. Motion's been made and <laughs> properly seconded. Um, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. Good luck. Thank you. Ms. Lamb, next case. Next case is 2018-591. Is the appellant here for this case? Yes. All right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this property involves, uh, pr uh, I'm sorry, this case involves property at 9478 Highway 96. Um, in this case, the appellant is challenging the denial of an STRP application due to prior operation without a permit. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 591? Seeing no opposition, the appellant will have five minutes to make your um, presentation to the board after Mr. McBroom makes the presentation on behalf of staff. Okay, please state your name, address, why you're here. My name is Christine Wise. My address is 9478 New Highway 96 West. Mr. Chairman and board members, I began short-term renting our house in the fall of 2015. We live on eight wooded acres right at the edge, southern edge of Davidson County. Have never had any problems with our renters or our neighbors. I signed on with a company then to take care of our business license, et cetera, and set us up for Davidson County taxes. We have paid our taxes on a monthly basis. Um, I thought we were compliant. However, we received a letter from your offices telling us to cease renting because we did not have a permit. We immediately ceased and took our house off the short-term rental site. My husband and I are retired, and we were using this to supplement our retired income. It's not a lot of money, as we average one to two weekend rentals per month, but it was enough to take care of some bills. I am appealing today to see if you would allow us to continue doing short-term rentals. Mr. Chairman and board members, thank you for your consideration. Okay, so you didn't have a permit. Correct. And when did you, why did you not get a permit? Uh, I had worked with an outside company that I thought had oh, given us all of the... You entrusted them to get the permit? Yes, yes, uh, yes. And the uh, so Davidson when, County taxes to be paid. Because you paid, so obviously you thought you had some because you yes, paid taxes. Yes, yes, and that all the payments were cashed. Okay. Um, so, so tell me this. You, um, when you got the letter, you must have been surprised. So what did, what did you do yes, when you got the letter? Yes, uh, so at that point we um, ceased, we just took it off of all of the Did you have sites. future listings? I had a couple that were in, the, the letter came in September, I had a couple in October, and when we visited the permit uh, office, he said take those off, you know, go ahead and call and tell them you cannot uh, do those. And so I canceled and those. Uh -huh. okay, and good. they didn't have anything after that. So okay, wonderful. that was September 18. Okay, questions for the applicant? Okay, do you have anything else to add? No. Thank you for being here and being honest. Okay. Um, we have not heard from Mr. McBroom on this one, although I see he has given us oh. a sheet. Yes, Mr. McBroom, do you have anything else to add besides your summary of this particular case? Can I ask the applicant a quick question? Sure, Sorry. of course. Who is the company, ma'am, and are you still using the company? Yes, it's uh, Avalara Tax. Okay, and that's who was managing this for they're, you? Yes, they're doing all the taxes for and me. I hope they're doing <clears throat> the right thing. <laughs> have they been advised that you did not have the proper permit? I don't know. I don't think I have advised them. Okay, so. thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions of the applicant? Okay, Mr. McBroom, we have your sheet in front of us, but tell us anything else that we need to know about this property. Uh, well, it um, came to us through a host letter. First mm -hmm. activity was September the 1st of uh, 2015. Uh, operation dates uh, 9-15 through 11-17. Uh, 15 rentals uh, that were documented, uh, of course not permitted. Um, the host letter was sent on September the 5th. Estimated delivery would be September the 13th. 
of last year and the appeal file was uh, 9 20 of 18. There was no other action taken. <clears throat> the advertisement was removed on 9 24 of 18. Um, Mr. Osborne did want me to comment though that the um, last date of rental is not certain because the um, applicant um, indicated that the uh, that they re relied heavily on the rentals of the property sure. for income. Okay. Well, we'll ask uh, any questions for Mr. McBroom. When was the last date you rented it? Or it was in September um, of last year. Okay. But, I, but I can't remember. And I had two rentals in October that I canceled. Okay. Sure. That's fine. Thank you. We're going to close public hearing discussion. Mr. Taylor, you seem to like these kind of cases. <laughs> Where does this? You got that from my reaction on the last one? <laughs> um, no, I mean, it, you know, I, I don't have I don't have any information to support the concern, and so that uh, leaves me with the, what we have on the the surface, which is September. Um, is is the last rental? And so I, you know, I'll, I'll move the zoning administrator didn't err and the applicant is eligible to apply for a permit on uh, January 31st. Okay, motion's been made, is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Pass. You're eligible to reapply at the end of the month. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Lamb, what's next? Next case is case 2018-714. Is the appellant here on this particular property? Yes. Uh, this property is located at 2253 Luster Road. Uh, this is an item A appeal challenging the zoning administrator's denial of a short-term rental permit due to operation prior to obtaining the legally required permit. Mr. McBroom is here on behalf of staff. He'll make our presentation after that. The appellant will have five minutes to make her presentation. Um, when you do make your presentation, please be sure to identify yourself by name and address. The first activity for uh, this property was on um, August the 5th of 18. Uh, operation dates August 18th through October the 18th, 11 rentals. Um, not previously permitted. <clears throat> the um, host letter was sent on October the 11th. Estimated delivery uh, would have been on the 19th, and the appeal was filed on November the 6th. Um, there were no uh, documented complaints associated with the property, no other action taken. Advertisement removed on the 6th. Um, The address that was uh, documented on the uh, application for the uh, BZA appeal, however, is 9638 Rocky Hill Road, Las Casas, Tennessee. And is this, this is for an owner-occupied, is, is it an application for an owner-occupied? Um, or, or would they be eligible for non owner occupied I, they would not be eligible if it is not their um, permanent uh, residence. Um, I do not have a copy of the application before me, so I don't know if they, what they applied for. Okay, let's get started. Name, address, and why you're here. My name is Shirley Stevens. I live at um, 9638 Rocky Hill Road in Las Casas, Tennessee. Um, first, thank you. Um, I Once I... Mr. Osborne and Ms. Shepard began to work with me. I got to come and watch you in action because my case got postponed. It's neat to see somebody that knows parliamentary procedure and I'm sad that you're gonna be done in a month with what you do. And it was just really neat to see what all of you do and get to spend time here. So thank you. Um, I own this property. It was my primary residence for several years. I moved here from Alaska. Uh, my daughter began to go to MTSU and I bought a place closer to MTSU that she was going to be the primary resident residence of. We own it together. This place was rented for four years to the star of a TV show with a property manager here in Nashville. Paid good rent for it and trashed it completely. So 
as I heartbreakingly put it back together, because it is a beautiful home and it's where my kids last lived with me, um, a friend said, hey, you can rent this on Airbnb, you're in the county, you don't need to do anything. And um, I thought they would know, they did not, obviously, and so it is. it was in violation. Um, I did not realize that we have to live in it in order to rent it in, in Davidson County, but I can certainly do that before I apply. It's, it's that easy. So. How many times did you rent it? It's, we have 11 here, is that? That is seven? correct. Mm -hmm. And um, when you got the letter, did you, uh, can, did you have any future bookings to cancel? I did, I had many. It was How very many? popular. Um, not sure, but I just reached out to Airbnb and had them cancel them rather than try to cancel okay. them myself. And they did? They did. Okay. Mm -hmm. And by the way, um, I listed it for a minimum of 31 nights and after. that's long term, yeah. You yeah, after I got the letter right. and then I called because the letter that we get says you can call, and I left messages to see if that was okay. Nobody returns those calls, by the way. So I think they need to take that out of the letter and just say email us. Is this Nashville or Airbnb? No, this is Nashville. It's Mr. Osborne saying you okay. can call this number, and I called oh. and called and called and said, hey, can Mr. I rent this Mr. for 31 Mr. days? Mr. McBroom, do you care to respond? <laughs> Nobody returned my call. I apologize, what was the question? Oh, she's saying that the number at the bottom of the letter she called and she couldn't reach anybody. I wanted to know if I could rent it for 31 days and keep it up there because that made sense to me that yeah. it would be a long 31 term. 31 days is not yeah, short term. Yeah, exactly. But nobody returned my call. Ma'am, I don't have a copy of the letter before me, but I believe there's also an email address on there. There is, but I don't do well with email. I do great on the phone. <laughs> well, so. okay. I've, just, my just, it's just feedback. It's yeah. just feedback. Yeah. We should probably pull the number if we're not going to return calls. Just that simple. Just like okay. when you tell me I blew it. I'm yeah. here. So. I, th I think, how many uh, short-term rental permits do we currently have? How many oh, thousands? Like yeah, oh, about I'm sure. 5,000. Yeah, and you know, how many people that are operating without Yeah, one? I looked so at the numbers, six, 600,000 so. and 50, yeah. dollars a month coming yeah. in from. We have two people and they're often out in the yeah. field, so I apologize. I got it, and that. I'm grateful to yeah. them mm -hmm. for getting me on the right path. Okay, any other questions for the applicant? Okay, we're gonna close the public hearing. Discussion. So this is another rule, Airbnb, and hasn't been rented a lot. And oh, when the last time it was rented, when was the last time you rented it? What day? I have all my, uh, it was. The uh, last one. The letter actually got to my house at, after October 18th and there was one in progress. So that was the last one. Okay. Okay, very good, thanks. Okay, discussion. I'm still not clear. Is she trying to apply for an owner-occupied, even though she clearly well, says she, she doesn't live there? Well, she said that she would fix that and move there if that's what it took. So, but we're I've used, set. excuse me, I'm sorry. I've used this as a second home throughout. My belongings are there. Uh, it has a, a studio piece and a main piece, and I've retained that studio piece throughout. So it's my secondary, not my primary. But I'm you single. would have to make yeah, it your primary. Yeah, I understand that, and I can do that. Okay. Thank you. Okay, discussion? So I mean, this is similar to the last case to me, um, you know, only rented, this is 11 times. It's not one of these places. It's a $5 Uber ride from Lofer Broadway that attracts these bachelorettes and such. Um, the applicant, when they found out that they were in violation of the law, contacted Airbnb and all the future bookings were taken down. So I would move that we, that this person, that zoning administrators did not hear, and this person be eligible to apply for a permit on January 31st. This motion. Motion has been made, properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, it passes. Now to apply for a permit, an owner-occupied permit, you really have to live there and have proof that you live there. So that'll give you some time between now and the 31st. I'm there often, so okay. I'm glad to make it home. Very good, thank you. Okay, Ms. Lamb, what's next? Next case, Mr. Chairman, is 2019-024, involving property at 5107A Tennessee Avenue. Is the appellant here on this case? Yes. Um, Mr. Chairman, this is uh, challenging the denial of a short-term rental permit um, due to a change in ownership. In this particular instance, the property was quick claimed to a new owner after the permit had expired. Um, the appellant or the property owner came in to apply for a new permit after the um, 
permit had expired. However, as this board knows, there is a provision in the local law that says that any no oper no permit can be or no operation short term rental operation activity can take place until the owner of the property has obtained the permit. So the owner came in, the new owner came in to obtain the permit. Um, as the board also knows, state law. Um, has dictated that the law in effect at the time the permit was issued is the law that governs unless there is a change in ownership. If there is a change in ownership, that effectively kills the permit, and the law in effect today is what governs. So in this particular property, the property, um, or in this particular case, rather, the property was, ownership was transferred, the owner came in to get a new permit, but the current law does not allow this because it is not owner occupied in a residential zoning um, district. So that's the situation. It's a basically changing ownership, and it was denied due to that. Is there anyone in opposition to this case? Seeing no opposition, the appellant will have five minutes to make your uh, presentation to the board. Please identify yourself by name and address. My name is Britt DePriest, 1601A, 7th Avenue North. You want to? My name is Ken Wade, and I'm the property owner at 5107 Tennessee Avenue. Okay, let's hear from Mr. McBroom. Tell us about this case, Any, um, how many stays, when did it get taken down, and any non, uh, other non-permitting complaints? Um, well, first off, the, um, the property was operating with a permit, which was um, issued to Ken Wade. And then subsequently, that was on um, the 22nd of February of uh, 2017. Subsequently, the ownership change occurred um, where it went to Ken Wade Properties LLC, a technicality, but yet it's a transfer of ownership and it therefore um, causes the permit to be null and void, as Ms. Lamb has explained. However, um, that was not picked up on until um, the permit had expired, was not renewed. Um, the host letter was sent at that point. That host letter went out on the 2nd of uh, March of 18, and the estimated delivery would have been the 10th. The appeal was filed on the 29th of November of 18, and um, there was one complaint with this property, and it was, uh, however, it was just associated with advertising XX, excess occupancy. I uh, cited them on that, and they complied in the specified um, remedial time, and therefore the case was closed. Um, the date the advertisement was removed was initially uh, June uh, 17th of 18. However, it did repost some months later and then was removed on November the 29th. Why do you think it reposted? In my experience, without firsthand knowledge, in my experience, um, a three to six month period, an Airbnb advertisement will repost automatically unless it is completely removed. Mm -hmm. and more frequently than that, though, it's usually not just Airbnb. Okay. So, what happened? Why did this repost? Yeah, sure. So, oh, I'm sorry, why did it repost? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I would imagine that it's probably, like you said, where it reposts itself I if it's not take completely it totally removed. Down, then. I'm sorry, say that again, please. Well, let's get to the, the main point is you, you transferred ownership to an LLC. So, why, why did you do that? And uh, then, it was for insurance purposes. Ken has a couple of different LLCs, and one of them is insured uh, for more than the other ones. So he transferred ownership of the property from one of his LLCs into another and one of his LLCs. who thought that would be a good idea? Uh, was that at the advice of your insurance agent? It or? was, it was at the advice. Because do you understand what our laws say that basically if you change ownership, then the permit goes away? Yes, sir, I did, but not until after I went down to get my, to reapply for my permit, and I had no idea. So that your insurance person gave you very bad advice. Right, they're not in the Airbnb business, and uh, I just thought it would be a good idea to change from, I, I had no idea that it would kill my permit. Were you the only owner of this LLC? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, questions for the applicant? Okay, do you have anything else to add? I don't. No, sir. Why did the, um, and there was another issue that basically you did not, as I like to say, fill out an, an self address, an, an envelope, put a stamp on it, put a $50 check in it, and send it to codes. What happened? What are you referring to for you the $50 your, check? You didn't renew your permit. 
Uh, we tried to renew the permit, but we didn't know that the permit was canceled until we went down at the end of the permit after the one year. I went down to re to reapply for the permit for the for the next year, mm -hmm. and that's when I found out that that we had lost our permit due to a name change. I had oh, no idea. Okay, so they are if, if I could just yes, make sir. one point of clarification, the permit expired, mm -hmm. which the law says it expires. So the permit expired after that expiration, he came in to apply and codes based on the zoning determined that he was not eligible because That's the zoning is residential and this is a non-owner occupied but permit. But I believe we were in the 30 day window. Mm -hmm. I think there's a 30 day. Uh, okay, but still you don't want to let it fall to chance. No, no, sir. Okay, so um, we have a letter, an email of opposition, it's rather generic, from uh, Jeffrey Gaw that says, and this is kind of a classic uh, line, short-term rentals promote parties and obnoxious behavior. Please don't allow the appeal. I don't think we ever had any complaints other than the one uh, cited by... Uh, sure. Uh, about the number of people. Now, why didn't you? About I mean, the advertisement. So, how many people were you promoting? And if you weren't catering to parties or bachelorettes, why did you try to promote more than 10 people in your Well, place? I think it said we could sleep up to 13 people. 13? Just, Come on. just simply because that's the number of beds that we had available. Oh, just because you have 13, it's like, right? I think that's quantified in the rules, right? No, Isn't it's it? not. Isn't? It's not quantified in the rules that no. you can have X number of people for twice bedroom. No, it's twice the number of bedrooms plus four, so a maximum of 12, depending on the number of bedrooms. And I think once we were notified, we took okay. that advertisement down and Okay, it. very good. We're gonna close the public hearing discussion. And just before you deliberate, if I could point out again, we're here to, the appeal is not, this is one whether or not we erred in denying the permit because of an ownership change. So I think the issue here ownership is whether change. or not is ownership yep. change okay. not operating not the, without a permit. Okay. So it's not, sure. the year is not in play here. I thought that there was a one year suspension. That's why we waited until November to, to apply the appeal. Um, but uh, I was watching Channel 3 one night, one of, one of these hearings, and mm -hmm. I saw a guy in here with the same situation as me. and. He was granted his permit, so we went ahead and filed ah, the appeal. All situations are different. Come on. So the last time you rented... You didn't, you didn't have anybody that got a permit because of a change of ownership. Oh, you haven't... Uh, it was a yeah. different issue. Yeah. It was from one entity to another, but the same same owner, just sim similar to my situation. Okay. We're going to close the public hearing discussion. The old LLC change of ownership, which seems to be the, the only issue is: did the zoning administrator err by revoking the permit because there was a change of ownership? And I don't hear there being any dispute about there being a change of ownership. I think he didn't revoke it. I think he wouldn't give it. Would but, not give yeah. it because of the change of ownership. Right. Well, yeah. The, the, well, and yeah, because I mean, it, it basically they said there was a change of ownership, which meant it, it was ineligible, but it. It also wasn't renewed because of the change. The change of ownership meant that, that, that it wasn't the same applicant, but it also had expired. So, I mean, there was a whole lot of issues that say, you know, this, that this is a little different than the others. But, but I think there, it, it appears factual that there was a change of ownership and that the zoning administrator didn't err in that determination. And... You know, I, I don't think we have, I mean, we've upheld the zoning administrator's interpretation of the law in regards to a change of ownership, and I don't see anything different on this I, one, so. Yeah, I don't, I don't either. We've had quite a few of these cases now over the past couple of months. So, so does anyone have a motion? I move to uphold the decision of the zoning administrator. Okay. Motion has been made. Is there a second? Motion has been made and properly second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. Next case is 2019-028 involving property at 719 Douglas Avenue, number 13. Challenging the cancellation of a short-term rental permit that was issued an error based on the zoning of the property. In this instance, the zoning is SP, which as this board knows is a zoning category that is interpreted and administered by the planning department. The planning department made the determination that this particular SP at issue did not allow the short-term rentals, thus codes canceled the permit as a result of that interpretation. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 28? Seeing none, Jamie Holland is here on behalf of the appellant, owner of the property. Mr. Holland, you'll have five minutes to make your presentation to the board. Please identify yourself by name and address. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Jamie Howell, 1006 Fatherland Street. And to my right is my client, Sandy Brainerd. We're gonna hear from Mr. McBroom first. Yeah, Mr. McBroom, get started. Um, well, Mr. Chairman, uh, this is uh, strictly an SP. Really, all I have to add is that there were um, no additional rentals following the cancellation. Okay. Any questions for Mr. McBroom? Thank you, Mr. Holland. Let's get started. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think the, the best way to go about it is, is a timeline because the SP is BL 2013-627. The effective date of that SP was January 31, 2014. Uh, shortly thereafter, in, on October 24, 2014, uh, uh, Mr. Michaels predecessor, Bill Herbert, off, authored an opinion letter saying that short-term rental was accessory use. Then DL 2014-951, also known as the Enabling Ordinance, became law on February 26, 2015. Shortly thereafter, less than a month, the Companion Ordinance setting forth that short-term rental was an accessory use under Title 17. January 5, 2017, uh, the short-term rental permit at issue in this case was issued. Uh, February 2, 2018, for the first time, uh, BL 2017-608 created commercial uses for non-owner occupied. And as we know, May 15, 2018, the General Assembly and the Governor signed the Short-Term Rental Unit Act stating that the applicable law is the ordinance uh, at issuance of the permit. All that to say that was the enabling ordinance. At the time of issuance of the permit, there was no distinction relative to use. In other words, short-term rental was accessory. It didn't matter if you were owner-occupied or non-owner-occupied. It's all residential use. And from looking at planning's uh, letter and also the caption of the applicable SP, it says limited to residential dwelling units and general office uses. Let's ignore general office uses for a moment. And residential use, that's what this, per this use was at the time of issuance of the permit. Going back to the caption of that of the SP, it says to permit up to 29 residential dwelling units and office use at 719 Douglas. That being the case, I would ask that the permit be reinstated. And pending your questions and any comments from Ms. Brainerd, I'm not seeing my timer, Mr. Chairman, so I don't know where I am on that. What's there? <laughs> Two minutes. Okay. <laughs> Good, so, thank you. Um, since prior people were mentioned, I want to ask uh, our zoning administrator um, about the interpretations of these reference letters or kind of what they might have an impact on this particular case. Uh, the zoning administrator saying, you know, use in SP districts and things like that. October Mr. Hawk. Is that the letter you mean? Yes. Doc, October 24, 2015, 2014, that was his letter from pre-legislation to uh, council member Allen that initiated the legislation. Yeah, and I think Mr. Holland just kind of explained it very capably there. Uh, before there was citywide legislation from council bill 2014, 951, 951 which took effect uh, start of April 2015, uh, there was an effort to try to determine, okay, well, exactly what do we do with this emerging land use? It's not specifically identified under our land use table, not defined under the definition section of the zoning code. Is it a boarding house? Is it a department? Is it a hotel use? Is it merely a off the books use of your single family residence or two family residence? So in an effort to figure out exactly where to pin it, uh, the letter that Mr. Hall incited was kind of the guidance provided by the then zoning administrator, now director of codes, Mr. Herbert, which ultimately led to, in part, I should say, led to the legislation that was put forth by council member Allen and several others and passed by the Metro Council to establish the land use, figure out a regulatory scheme and a permitting scheme as well. So it was probably, at least to my knowledge, and Mr. Holland can correct me if he knows differently, 
the first formal declaration of any sort, certainly from the codes department, and to my knowledge, from any of the metropolitan government's agencies, boards, or commissions, acknowledging the use as a very specific thing and identifying how to treat it vis-a-vis -vis zoning regulations and the land use table in particular. Um, <laughs> The opinion was, I shouldn't say mooted by the legislation that went into place, but certainly once we had an ordinance in place, we had an entire regulatory scheme, an enforcement mechanism, and a permitting requirement that took effect in April of 2015. So to the question, Mr. Chairman, exactly what weight do we give this or how do we view this as a declaration of the uh, acknowledgement of the use and what to do with it vis-a-vis -vis the land use table, uh, effective October of 2014. And I think that that was probably um, well, again, I don't recall, even though I was still at the legal department at that time, but I don't recall any other documentation providing guidance on the topic until the legislation was effectuated. Okay, any questions to the applicant? No. Can you, can you <clears throat> so that I catch on here, it's anytime it gets towards four o'clock, we've heard a lot of these, it goes, <laughs> it goes fast. So. I'm with you. So the, it was revoked because in this SP, it has to be owner occupied, correct? I, I, I think that's fair okay. to yeah. say uh, under six, post 608, yes. I'm okay, and by post 608, Mr. Holland, you're meaning? <clears throat> February 2nd, 2018. Okay. Bill 2017, 608, that moved non-owner occupied permits from accessory residential use into a commercial use category. Okay, and you're saying the, the zoning administrator aired how? Well, I, I know we have to say the zoning administrator, but I think the impetus behind all this is the planning department. And they aired by making that determination based on the current facts. And the current facts are that it's a non-owner occupied permit, true, that's true. And it's a commercial use, and a commercial use is not allowed in this, this SP. I would agree with that. I think that's an honest statement of current law. So How, you, the, you, the use is not allowed in this SP, you agree with that, you, under the current law? <coughs> you, couldn't come, you couldn't come in here and get okay. a new permit today okay. for, for non-owner occupied in this development. Mr. Okay. Holland, this board can overturn the zoning administrator, but we cannot overturn the planning department. Right. So. I, I, I understand, I, I, and I'm not suggesting that, you know, I, I think the zoning staff is relying on right. the opinion of the planning department. Okay. In this occasion. And I think Mr. Ewing's right. I think your argument is your beef is really with the planning department, not not the zoning administrator. Well, the zoning administrator in the codes department revoked the permit, the planning department didn't. C correct. But you you don't you don't you you seem to agree that the zoning administrator had to do that, correct? Or are you saying that, because I thought no, I heard No, I wish the zoning administrator would have told the planning department that you're wrong and okay. we're going to keep that permit in place, but okay, he, he didn't do that. But, but the zoning administrator can't really do that. Can't really do what? Can't go tell the planning department they're wrong, correct? I mean, he's... I sure hope so, and if not, I would like to seek out council legislation to make sure he can in the future. Well, Mr. Pepper, I feel like to the question that you may be driving toward, yeah, we I'm, at I'm, the codes department, the zoning division in particular, believe that this is the proper venue for the appeal of the um, permit revocation or cancellation to come forward. Um, yes, the zoning staff relies on uh, the determination by the planning department as to whether or not an individual SP allows a short-term rental use. Um, and we've been consistent in taking their yes, no answer uh, because they do have legally the unique province to determine and administer and determine the uses allowed under SPs. That said, we still think this is the appropriate venue lacking any better venue to challenge the action in question, which of course was the cancellation or revocation. <clears throat> but I know that wasn't quite where you were, but I felt like that might be part of why, where you're heading. No, you, you, you put it better than I ask it, that's for sure. Uh, and I, I, I don't disagree with the thing he just said. Okay. So, we're just so but, okay. I, because I thought you said earlier, you, you didn't think the zoning administrator erred. Well, I think I'm 
I'm obligated to say that he did, even if, you know, regardless of my personal opinion. Okay. But, you know, in this case, yes, he, he erred by relying on the planning department. That's just a little okay. nuance. He, he, he made that opinion his own. Okay. The zoning administrator erred by relying on the planning department. Okay. <laughs> I'm with you. Yes, sir. Thank you for your patience with my questions. <laughs> Thank this you. This one was a little hard. And I, I appreciate the help from the zoning administrator. Okay. Um, any other questions? Okay, let's close the public hearing. Mr. Say. Chairman, if you, you know, just one oh, further point of clarification. How much, how much time does he have left? <laughs> yeah, Council Member Davis spoke in support here, and he was also the sponsor of the SP in question. Okay, Thank very you. good. Thank you. Close the public hearing discussion. Come on, we have our all lawyer group here. Uh, let's, let's. Well, I think the, the question we have to answer is, did the zoning administrator err? Uh, and I'm not sure that I understand why, how he did, or how it is being alleged that he did. I thought the allegation was that the law in effect, when when the permit was initially issued, short-term rentals were an accessory use, and they did not until later become a commercial use. And therefore, your argument is the law in place at the time the permit was issued applies, and under that law, she can get a per she, If that law still existed today, she could get a permit, right? That is correct. Okay, that's what I, but that's not how it's been interpreted by our zoning administrator. And with respect to Mr. Holland, who I think always comes with good legal arguments, in my opinion, I don't think there's sufficient evidence or facts before us to say that he erred. But I, I'm happy. I want to discuss it. What do y'all think? <clears throat> I don't see that he, did, that he did either. What do you think, David? No, and, you know, like I said, I disagree with um, Mr. Holland's argument about planning. I mean, planning, they operate independently of us, and, you know, I think if his beef is with planning, that's the venue, not over here. You know, we're determining whether the zoning administrator erred. And I hope this all gets worked out. In Chancery Court, I think that's going to be a next place. I think somebody's already moved that direction. But for right now, the way I see it on these these uh, kinds of cases, I don't see that there's an error. Does anyone have a motion? <coughs> I'll move to uphold the zoning administrator's decision. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. The slam. Next case. Next case is Move to the <laughs> Wait a minute. The next case is, is 2019 03. Is he one. representing that client? He's representing Mr. That Holland, client. come back here. Did, are you deferring to case number 31? The next case? Yes, sir. Please treat this staff with better respect than walking out outside of the. Okay. So, um, I move that we have hear this case right now. Uh, I don't think we're going to be able to anyway. I know Pam and Will Walton and go. I go way back with the Walton, so I was going to have to recuse myself okay. from this one, which would unfortunately leave us without a Okay, quorum, well, so. we, we won't hear it for that reason, but not the reason of the counselor. So we will defer at one meeting. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion that we defer one meeting. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Motion's been made properly second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. And our staff is to be treated more respectfully, Mr. Holland. If you were in a court of law, you would not treat a judge that way, walking out of a courtroom, I asking for a deferral. Okay. I, I think more of them than any other person I know. Okay. Well, there's a way to ask for a deferral, and you didn't ask for it in the proper way. Well, I'm sorry you disagree. Okay. Okay. So we'll see you next month or next meeting. Mr. Holland, thank you. Stop talking. Okay. Ms. Lamb, next case.
Next case, Mr. Chairman, is 2019-037, involving property at 1323 3rd Avenue North. Is the appellant here? Yes, the appellant is here for this. This was a denial of a short terminal permit due to, um, let me look at, apologies, let me check my notes, make sure I've got the right case before you. Um, so this was denied due to op uh, operation after the permit expired. So we no longer had a valid permit, but continued to operate. Thus, um, when he came in, I guess, to reapply, reinstate the permit, it was denied due to that operation without a valid permit. Um, seeing no opposition here, you're not, are you here in opposition to this? Oh, this was okay. the case. Seeing no opposition here, uh, Jason Boyan is the appellant. Mr. Boyan, you'll have five minutes to make your presentation, but before you make your presentation, Mr. McBroom will make the presentation on behalf of staff. Mm. Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Osborne uh, has a case in court against this at the Environmental Court, and he has asked that this case be deferred until after that case is adjudicated. Okay. Um, any questions for Mr. McBroom about that? When is it set? Please. If you'll give me one moment, I'll find that out for you. I want to ask the applicant in the meantime what the applicant. I apologize for the delay. The Wi-Fi is a little slow. It's February the 6th. Okay. So do you have any questions based on that? For the applicant. Okay. Yeah. Please state your name, address, why you're here. Sir, sure. my name is Jason Boylan, B-O-Y-L-A-N. I'm here uh, just trying okay, to get well, my... Okay, well, wait a minute. Before we have a question. Yes, ma'am. There's, there's been a request of this case be continued until after you go to environmental court, which is about two, three weeks away. Do you want to be heard here today? Or are you agreeable to continuing the case till after environmental court? I, I'd like to be heard. Um, okay, that's fine. If that's okay, with okay. respect to the board. Um, so I, I renovated this home in Germantown. I lived in it from 06 to 13. I uh, obtained my permit in 15 um, for non-occupier. Um, my wife and I, we took care of the B&B property. And then when, you know, she went back to work, I own a business. Uh, it's the reason, you know, it's hard for me to get in, to take a half a day off. I run a medical business and it's hard to staff. That's why I'd like to speak. Um, the. The way I came into knowledge of not having 
a permit anymore was the day before Thanksgiving, a officer handed something to me and said, you've been operating without a permit. So the first of my knowledge, 2017, I turned over uh, the B&B the property to a service who said they were gonna take care of the permit and um, you know all the taxes, which are up to date. So of course I was in shock, went to codes, and then I found, you know, I was never notified. Of course, I know that you don't necessarily notify that the permit is up for renewal, and I do know that the buck stops here for that. However, there was a 30-day notice that goes out or something of that nature, which was not sent to either the, the playlist properties, which is the one that was listed in February of 2018 as the con point of contact, nor was it sent to my home that I live in in East Nashville. It was sent to the actual B&B property where nobody would have received this notice. So I was shocked. Went straight to codes right away, shut down all the bookings, and I'm just trying to do the right thing here. I, I'm worried, you know, if I go to court, fine, if they, excuse me, if they turn me down, I'll live with that. But I just wanted to be able to say, this was a clerical error, it seemed, and I've been doing everything by the book. And I just, it, it was just a misunderstanding. And I just really feel like, you know, I, I'm just trying to plead my case here. I'd like to try Why to- Why didn't you renew your back. permit? I, again, I turned over, when my wife went back full time, I turned over to a service. who said they were gonna renew my permit for me. And who is this service? They're called Playlist Properties. So why didn't you do it yourself? It's not that hard to renew. It's basically sending us a $50 I check. I absolutely would have. I just never received a notice, and I know that maybe that's not common practice. And any notice after that, that it was going to be renewed, both was not sent to me. I mean, I know that pleading ignorance is maybe not the right way to go, but there was nothing was sent to my home except for a police officer who knew where I lived to hand me this notice, and I just, if they knew where I lived, if he knew where I lived, then I, I would assume that somebody would have sent the letter to the right place. We've heard many uh, stories like this before, and it's up to the applicant to know when their permit needs to be renewed and send the check into the codes department to renew it. We do not send out renewal notices, correct? That is correct. We do not send out renewal notices, and we often compare it to like a driver's license, for example. When you have a license to drive or license to do something, you the onus is on the permit holder to know when the uh, license expires. Yep, okay. So no notices are sent to at all? No. no. So questions for the applicant? Anything else to add? Mr. Chairman, before the board deliberates, I believe Mr. McBroom has a presentation to make. Oh, okay, yes. <clears throat> the operation dates were uh, October of 2015 through October of 2018. Now, the number of rentals um, after the permit expired was um, approximately four. Uh, it was, of course, previously permitted, but was not renewed. <clears throat> the host um, identified it and sent the letter on August the 4th of 18. Uh, estimated delivery would have been the 12th. And on um, um, September the 5th of 18, another uh, cease and desist order from host was sent um, to a subsequent address. Um, Which address was that? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I don't have that before me. It was the, it's the address of record, which all, all Metro um, notifications go to the address of record, and it's incumbent upon the property owner to keep that updated as well. I have the address of record for... Sir. No. Okay. Uh, the date that the advertisement was removed was um, November 22nd of 18. Okay. Uh, anything to ask Mr. McBroom? Mm -hmm. Okay, no, thank you. Uh, anything else, board members? Okay, we're gonna close the public hearing discussion. This is a non-renewal case that was testified they didn't send $50 in the Metro to renew their permit, and four times after that lapse, they have rented. So, and as mentioned, there's a case pending in environmental court. So, board members.
He rented only four times in the two years following the expiration of his permit. He stopped or has not rented since he received notice that he was non-permitted. And I would move that he is allowed to reapply on January 31st. I second that. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Post passes, you are eligible to reapply on the 31st. For a permit that no longer exists. Well, yes, but you are now eligible. So you can go and fill out all the paperwork and go back through the process. So, Ms. Lamb, is there any other business in front of the BZA today? That concludes the business of the BZA. Okay. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.